Hello everyone, it's Yin Tan here, and today I'm going to be reading out the CSM14 Winter Summit minutes in full. Note that these minutes are redacted for NDA content and may often be edited to hide conversations about upcoming features or changes that CCP wants to keep secret from the general public, and will also generally not cover features that are cancelled as a result of CSM input. If you'd like to download an MP3 version instead of having to listen to the whole thing on YouTube, I've made this available for free via a post in my Patreon, which is linked in the description below. Timestamps to specific sections are also listed there. I have as much as possible attempted to stick to the original wording of the document, though I have expanded on some terms, such as replacing DAU with daily active users, and cleaned up some of the more clunky sentences just so that I could actually read them. I hope you enjoy. Section 1. EVE Online. Vision and Future. CCP Burger kicks things off with a PowerPoint and a round of introductions for the CSM and CCPers. This was a presentation that was shown to the company a few days earlier. The focus of the development team into winter is split into 80% for early retention and 20% for veteran stagnation. The latter team will also tackle the economy. Next, we see top funnel stats, and a comment is made that a lot of focus last year for CCP went into ensuring that the company is GDPR compliant. CCP Burger then shows the monthly active user and daily active user stats on a customer level. The criteria here are for 10 minutes of activity in order to register in these metrics, and bots and such are weeded out to the best of CCP's ability. CCP Burger says that there is a historical summer dip that doesn't pick up again until mid-September, and that the summer dip was not as long or persistent as previously. Arith asks if CCP tracks this data on an account level, and if they're going to show that and whether or not this chart is just the best looking on a health level. CCP Burger says that that is not the case, this is just the most relevant one overall. CCP Manbjorn chimes in that CCP has many graphs like this and statistics that are reviewed frequently at local and global staff meetings and used to teach the developers and CCPers across the organization how the health of the game is measured. CSM asks what the spikes are in the chart and these are login campaigns that were executed throughout the year. Arith brings up some concerns about the DAU for the last year as it has been very low. CCP Orca clarifies that the monthly active user, on the contrary, is the highest. This is a concern for CCP, as the retention of new players being bad is the cause of this discrepancy. CCP Orca also mentions that a lot of changes that have been made resulted in improvements across the board in the funnel for new players registering and getting into the game. One example of this was fixing the download on demand system, which resulted in a 5% increase alone. CCP Manbjorn mentions that they did a lot of A-B testing for changes to the site, and that a lot of work is small improvements behind the scenes that may not be very obvious to the players. The conversation about a download button on the main site was brought up again, and CCP clarifies that no one in the room ultimately made the decision and that this is still being worked on. CCP Orca points out that for a completely new player, downloading the game is very obvious and not hitting, not affecting them. The main concerns are for returning players being able to find the launcher. Gobbins asks if large nullsec block wars have any effect on the MAU and DAU. CCP Burger says that there is a delayed increase if the war is huge enough to get into the media, and this will result in an influx of new players and reactivation. Merkel Chen asks if a new player looks the same as an old player from a data perspective, even though the market has changed so much throughout the years. CCP Orca replies that it's very much the same, but this change is also why CCP has been working on the funnel. CCP Burger mentions that people encountering bugs will not file a bug report but instead just leave. CCP Orca then also mentions some fundamental support changes such as live chat, meet and greet, and more GM presence in the game. Merkel Chen says that games such as Fortnite allow players to jump in and start running immediately, which is something that EVE Online is lacking. Abyssal Dead Space was heading in the right direction to offer similar fun and easy to get into the experience. CCP Muppet Hunter says that it did achieve their goals, but the adoption rate could be higher, and the feature should be made accessible to new players. CCP Burger brings up the four main points of focus for CCP. Number one, stop the bleeding. Number two, fix the stupid. Number three, excite and teach. And number four, incentivize return. 
he explains that some aspects of the game that this address, such as losing players before they even log in, fixing the download on demand feature to make sure that it downloads the correct assets actually being used in the 30 minutes of gameplay, fixing the tutorial's instructions and making them more intuitive and correct. He also mentions getting stuck on geometry and not warping away. It's something CCP tried to fix 7,000 million times and it never worked. Another change is the fitting warnings that are on Sissy. CCP Manbjorn summarizes that Fix the Stupid is everywhere in the development and affects every part of the game. CCP Burger brings up the brave new NPE and that technically it is good, but there are a lot of game design aspects that should be better. CCP Burger brings up another example of what he wants to see changed, such as a scenario when you get your first upgraded gun that is 20% more effective, but the next NPC you are going to face is 50% more difficult, which makes players feel like the weapon is actually worse. The mining laser is also being removed from rookie ships because it causes confusion. CCP Burger brings up the guiding principle to early life in EVE Online. The entrance to the game should be thematic, engaging and linear. This is currently in the game right now, but it's a tad too long. He wants EVE Online to invoke a feeling of butterflies in players' stomach so that they can relate to those epic trailers they saw or stories they read about. CCB Burger then mentions that EVE is a completely different beast to what it was originally. The complexity is just insane and there haven't been any changes made to guide or ease the new players into the game, or simply just hiding some content that is irrelevant to them in the first five minutes. Innominate mentions the attributes as an example of this complexity and how important that system is. CCB Burger responds that it is a system that just adds unnecessary complexity, and both the CSM and CCP agree that it should be removed. Modular tutorials are something that the development team wants to go towards, but that is not three months away. Merkel Chen asks CCP Manbjorn what he thinks is the main cause of this issue. CCP Manbjorn says that it's the UX. There is a lack of purpose or direction shown through that. Merkel Chan follows that with a question about the difference between a lone player and someone who has joined a corporation. CCP said the difference is huge because now the new player has a purpose. In essence, CCP wants to create a purpose for players in the first 15 minutes of gameplay, and then as the player keeps playing, they will be in a tutorial that merges into general gameplay. There is no limit to how long this tutorial could last for. CCB Manbjorn points out that for the longest time the tutorial has been overly complicated and boring. Another concern and problem in the past was the Empire selection and the perceived importance of this choice. CCB Burger gives an example of how a new ship is created and that game design has to create four ships, one for each race, but they all end up being the same to keep the balance. CCB Burger wants to move away from this mentality. CSM does ask where in the vision, this vision for a tutorial they would expect the new players to interact with others and maybe join corporations. CCB Burger says that there is a balance for this, some players will just want to loiter around in high sec and take their time, whereas others will dive right into null sec from minute one. CCB Burger says that this is something that he wants to dive into further with the CSM. The main concern here from the CSM is that the default channels for assistance are toxic and getting the new player into an actual group is better done as fast as possible. CCB Burger says that another point to consider is how to do the handover from tutorial to player groups. Fleets organised by Greygal were brought up as an example and that they had the highest retention rate CCP has ever seen. Vili asks why there aren't CCP organised fleets with specific splots for FCs. CCB Burger says that this was the inspiration for the Fleet Finder tool. CCB Manbjorn adds that they have to be careful not to only treat the symptoms and never fix the underlying issues. CCB Muppet Hunter says that CCP does not want to be forcing or incentivizing these fleets and get involved in such a level. He does ask, however, what the main points are for forming and running fleets. The main issue is bringing the people to the right location and also needing to talk to people, Removal of voice from the game made this too complex. CCB Muppet Hunter does say that CCB Mambion made an argument for a voice system being added back into the game. CCB Muppet Hunter also says that reducing the steps required to explain to the new players how to do certain things in the game, such as aligning, will result in a more organic spread of information. 
The point is that everything in the game is very complex and the tools such as the clicky helpy thing, images or GIFs aren't sufficient to teach players effectively. This all boils down to the original point of when CCP sees the handoff happening between the tutorial to the community. This is not something that has been decided by CCP and they ask back when the CSM would want that to occur. The CSM effectively says that there needs to be a tutorial for the basics, such as turning on modules or putting ammo in their guns. CCP Mambion says that this is a UX issue to begin with and that it needs to be more intuitive. Dunk Dinkle mentions that another thing is where the first gun that you get in the game doesn't require ammo, so the tutorial is teaching bad habits from the start. This goes back to Fix the Stupid. Dunk Dinkle gives an example of when he was watching a new player streaming and the chat was furiously trying to help and give pointers. CCP Burger says that the same problem happened in user testing, where himself, CCP Munther Hunter, and other CCPers were all hovering over the tester, scrambling to help. Dunk Dinkle also says that there is an issue of getting newer players to find corporations. Suggestions of having a corp rating system was brought up by another CSM member. CCB Burger says they want to simplify the onboarding and make EVE more accessible, but they also don't want to dumb it down. EVE is supposed to be complex. CCP definitely wants to explore some of the ways to give players options of joining player corporations. CCP Muppet Hunter also points out that it is way more effective if a player is talked to rather than if they approach the corporation themselves. CCP Muppet Hunter says that there is no question about corpse being important to CCP and a very valuable retention tool, but there is also a survivor bias involved in that. Human interaction in the early moments is a hugely important factor in retention. Villy asks about the idea of a fleet finder or group finder system. This is something that has been looked into. Villy says that he has played through the MPE about seven times, and every time he noticed that there were no mentions about corporations. CCP Burger says that these social groups mostly exist outside of the game flow. Villy asks if there has been consideration of creating an official Discord for EVE Online. CCP Dopamine interjects that the community team has looked into this at the beginning of the year, and right now it isn't something they commit, can commit to due to the level of quality they want to see. See, Gobbins suggests having audio cues for some specific commands, and CCP Mambjorn with CCP Burger say that they could use Aura for this. End of the first session. Section 2. The Blackout. CCP Muppet Hunter starts by telling the CSM what falls into the Age of Chaos, and lists drifters, the local blackout, and VNI changes. They've asked for analytics for more data on the effects that this has had. CCP Larrikin says that this information will be made available to them later down on the line. CCP Larrikin clarifies that a lot of data covered will be on a customer level. He pulls up a DAC, Daily Active Customers, graph for this period. Innomina asks what the deal with, was with the drifters, as it didn't seem like they worked exactly as intended. CCP Muppet Hunter says that there were a couple of bugs involved, and that CCP can and will plan this better in the future, once they dig further into the data. The goal isn't to find a red flag and stop doing this, but rather work on it better next time. Villy asks how heavy the attacks were intended to be. CCP Muppet Hunter says that there was no specific intention, but CCP wanted to see how players would react. Merkel Chen says that this really only affected a few people directly. Gobbin says that a lot of buzz was distorted in the media. For example, he asked why the drifter asked about the drifter attacks by a non-Eve player who heard that Eve Online was being invaded by aliens who burned everything to the ground. Upon learning that this wasn't actually the case, the person lowered their initial excitement and buzz. CCP Muppet Hunter says that any news is good news and generating buzz is always good. However, the end result needs to be refined. Dunk Dinkle says that he's not opposed to these things happening. However, it needs to be in moderation and there needs to be a reward, something to incentivize people to actively defend against these attacks rather than just wait it out. Aerith says that for the first time in EVE Online, this made the blue donut happen. Villy says that what the player base perceived is that the Drifters were an attack on them by CCP. CCP Muppet Hunter comments that it wasn't perfectly launched, but they will do better next time. Omeka Gold adds that PvE players won't do PvE that has no rewards. Gobbins asked if they would consider doing attacks through NPCs again, 
and CTB Muppet Hunter says that all NPC attacks are like that. Shipyards, FOBs, and roaming, roaming groups all do this. He then reiterates that drifters were not balanced properly, and that CCP will keep that in mind for the future. Gobbins replies that Soitoyos and FOBs can be destroyed in order for the NPCs to stop spawning, but no such win condition existed with the drifters. The CSM argues also that the scale of these attacks was out of line, and CTP Muppet Hunter goes back to point out that this was not balanced, and that they want to increase the NPC attacks from their current state, but not to the level of what was seen in the drifter attacks. CCP Larrikin shows a graph. Dunk Dinkle asks if there are any differences in new player logins between skill point uh, versus item rewards, and CCB Muppet Hunter says that this has not been AB tested. However, there is a team working on these kinds of features, and the CSM will have a presentation on that later. CCB Muppet Hunter adds that the data is muddy due to so many ongoing events in the same period. CCB Larrikin shows a few login graphs broken down by activity, location in the game, and alliance membership. Aerith notes that the blackout discouraged participation in the login campaign for the Nullsec players. The CSM has concerned about, concerns about the player activity in Null, and CCB Muppet Hunter says they want to dig deeper into this data and find more context, because they only received the data this morning. The daily ISK faucet shows l low attention players are making much less ISK than before. The main takeaway is that the low attention player ISK faucets have taken considerable dips which are beneficial to the EVE economy. The changes that affected everyone, but it hit the bots the hardest. Aerith argues that this was at the cost of Nullsec. The conversation is rather abstract and there is a lot of theorising about the numbers from the CSM, but CCP are adamant in pointing out that they have not looked through this data sufficiently yet, and will use it to target botters better in the future. CCP Larrikin says that one thing he will look into now is to determine how player activity and behaviour in Nullsec have changed. They are also investigating what is considered a healthy ISK faucet for the game. The blackout was brought up along with the duration of it, Vili says that it's reaching the point where the blackout is being normalised, and that will eventually lead to players leaving the game who are hoping this would be reverted. Omeka Gold counters this by saying that the normalising will result in an initial severe drop, and then will level out. The CSM would want to see tenure by space type, and believe that these changes are attacking the majority of veteran players. Aerith also asks what CCP considers a healthy amount of players in Nullsec. CCP Muppet Hunter says that there is no data for this right now, but this is why CCP is starting to collect this data. Session 3, Ship Balance and the Chaos Era Number 1. Dunk Dinkle asks for Tech 2 salvage drones and to change the Prime into a Moonor hauler, as it has lost its role to the Epithal. Anomina asks for nullified shuttles and to remove nullification from all other ships. CCP Rise chimes in, telling the newer members of the CSM that this has been a part of the discussion here for the last three years. CCP Rise asks how they feel about the nullification change made recently, and the response was that effectively the change just resulted in a shift to a different interceptor. Dunk Dinkle says that his main issue with nullification is the Tech 3 cruisers. Innominate says that the main use for interceptors is just an insta-warp taxi, which is fine for old players, but newer players don't have access to these ships. This should be moved to shuttles to make lives easier for new players. Gobbins asks why this hasn't been added to shuttles yet, and CCB Fozzy says that there is no particular reason, and adds that the main reason it hasn't been removed from combat ships is because it would be a buff to ratting. Vili says that this mostly affects subcapital ratting, but he was under the impression that CCP had been trying to address tac uh, capital ratting and supercapital ratting. CCP Rise clarifies that there were issues to address both with subcapital and capital ratting. Aerith asks about removing uh, warp core stabilizers. CCP Fozzy says that they have been discussing making this a hauler exclusive module at the cost of warp speed. However, removing this does create a concern that it would prevent players from going to explore in dangerous space. CCP Rise says that the early exploration has a net positive effect on new players and their retention. This mechanic affects mostly low sec players in a negative manner. Dunk Dinkle asks if there's a more widespread problem, and Anominate mentions stealth bombers using them. 
Vili says that it doesn't seem like a huge issue because the module has severe penalties. Merkel Chen shifts the conversation to time zone tanking structures as a content killer. He suggests increasing the time window to prevent this anti-gameplay. Steve Renukin feels that using the time zone timer as a tactic shouldn't be an option. Arith suggests a module or a structure that could expand the window. CCB Master Plan suggests having the time it takes to take effect will adjust based on how much of a change is being made, and the CSM liked that. Enomina and Gobbins think that a major issue with the current Citadels is that the final timer can be set to a weekday by the defender. This forces the attackers to either skip work or skip sleep for every Citadel kill. In the past, attackers were able to force weekend timers to bridge the two time zones. Arath says that structure tanking is a problem and that it is toxic. Gobbins goes to talk about the old POS system and how the attackers would be able to decide the day of the attack. He says that the issue is that there are three layers, defenders set the timers, and there are considerably more structures in space than in the POS days. CCB Fozzy explains that Upwell structures weren't designed to be only for alliances and is a bunch of systems put into one. To address Fozzie's concern of protecting the little guy, Gobbin suggests a structure that is not used in the Nolsec game for the little guy who wants their castle. CCB Fozzie says that there is potential here to make changes in that regard. Innominate mentions that the overall attacking dynamic for the POS system was nice, despite all their other faults. Merkel Chen asks if they would consider softening up low-powered structures, and CCP Fuzzy says that it's something worth considering. A nominate also mentioned asset safety and that older players were not a fan of it. He suggests having asset safety in Nullsec be limited to only working in the same system. CCP Fuzzy asks who would want to have asset safety removed in Nullsec and people show hands. He then asks who of those would do it for the betterment of the game, and now there were no hands. Merkel Chen suggests removing asset safety on low-powered structures only. Olmeca Gold asks about giving some of the asset safety tax to the attackers when the items are recovered. CCP Fozzy says that this is complicated to implement, to say the least. Dunk Dinkle suggests that the asset safety fee would go to the attackers rather than CCP, and CCP Fozzy says that this has been discussed in the past. He asks if having a similar system to the bounty system, where there is a trickle method for the payout to the attackers is something they would like, and the CSM seems to agree. Arith points out that the Apex Predator would now be getting paid to burn others down. Dunk Dinkle says that this would be more of a morale motivator rather than to directly fund the attackers. Olmeca Gold mentions that destroying your own structure in this system would give the free movement of goods using asset safety. Vili asks if Sinojammers had been discussed at all in the Chaos Era changes, and the short answer is no. CCP Fozzy gives a bit of history about the prior opinions from the CSM about the introduction of those structures. Vili goes on to say that three ja Sinojammers in a system is overkill, their self-repair is a problem, the time zone tanking, that they can be anchored on keep stars, and finally the damage cap. CCP Fozzy says that he will never advocate for a structure that can be repaired by players as a response to the self-repair mechanic, and that they won't change any fundamental things, but they can change some levers. Vili says that they should change the damage cap, make them squishier, and prevent them from being anchored by citadels. Vili also drops a comment that there is no advantage or point in killing citadels in the current meta. CCP Fozzy asks if any other structures they would want to have looked at, Vili suggests increasing the cap on the number of jump bridges. Olmeca Gold and Gobbins mentions preventing players from jumping through grates when scrammed. CCP Fozzy says that this is to keep them in line with Stargates. Steve Renokin mentions some random requests he had received, such as covert jump freighters, decoys to be used for defensive purposes or baits. CCP Fozzy said that something of that nature had been considered in the past, and fuel siphons. Arith feels that this would just be abused by larger groups, but otherwise have a very niche use. CCP Fozzy says that if they were to be done, it would definitely not be like old POS siphons. Olmeca Gold mentions the feeling of finding a jackpot in the game with abandoned pauses and so on. Merkel Chen brings up a proposal from the CSM. In short, it was that an unfueled structure will lose several of the characteristics of a fueled one in order to help combat structure spam. He then says that after a certain period, 
the structure goes on offline rather than low power and then have a single timer and turn into a loop pinata with asset safety being compromised. The cost of structures is super low now and this is problematic. Vili suggests a, a fee being added in some way to prevent one group from owning too many structures but doesn't impact the smaller groups like a scaling tax. CCB Fozzy asks for an approximate ratio of how problematic offensive versus defensive structure spam was, and the CSM feels that offensive spam is more of a problem. CCB Fozzy quickly mentions the idea of adding a multi-day anchoring period in hostile space with certain periods where they could be destroyed. The CSM generally liked that idea and discussed how the timers could potentially work. End of session 3. Section 4, Ship Balance and Chaos Era Part 2. Vili starts the session by asking about the Sino changes and if they are still happening on the 10th of September and if any further changes will occur. CCP Rise says that this will not change further for this release. Vili asks if there are any red light, green light conditions set for this change. He is worried that the upcoming changes have no goals in mind. CCP Rise replies that there is a set of goals for this change and one of them is to tackle the ease of response to tackled PvE capitals that's provided by Sinos. He then adds that this change is unsuccessful in addressing it. CCP Rise goes on to explain that the main thing that they will measure and need to monitor is to see if this has a negative effect on PvP as a whole and capital escalations. Vili says that the Chaos Era changes have had a negative effect on Nullsec and this needs to be addressed. CCP Muppet Hunter replies that this Chaos Era hit the ground running and has surprised CCP as well, but the design department is getting on top of this as soon as possible. CCP Muppet Hunter says that his main concern with the Sino changes will be the effect on materials going in and out of Null, and luckily that is something that is much easier to track. Dunk Dinkle says that there will be chaos for the first couple of days, as the industrial Sinos will become much more lucrative targets. Merkel Chen says that it seems the era of chaos is brutalizing the sheep of Eve, and CCB Rise says that that was kind of the goal of the whole thing, because farming and faucets were getting too high. Olmeca Gold mentions that the initial changes for the Rorqual were too strong in the favor of the sheep, and now the pendulum is swinging back to be heavily in the favor of the wolves. He has a concerns about a lack of development time to follow up on this. Aerith suggests having the Sino uh, field staying open despite the ship getting destroyed, and this current change will hamper the possibility of fights to happen. Omeka Gold says that the exclusivity of ships with a Shino should be ex expanded to heavy interdictors and battleships. There was a discussion among the table of how this will benefit roaming in Losec, but that it's quite obvious when a fleet has a Sino due to the limit of ships being able to field them. A hard Sinosaurial field was brought up to allow more capital fights, and right now CCP wants to hold off and see how the meta develops. Vili says that the blackout has been going on for 6-8 to eight weeks, and started to get normalised and has had an effect. Vili and Dunk Dinkle effectively want to see CCP have actual KPIs for these changes, and they don't seem to have been properly communicated from CCP. CCP Rise says that they have KPIs, but it's tricky with the number of changes implemented to determine whether or not they've been achieved, and CCP is working on better analysis. Omeka Gold quickly asks if it's possible to make the Sino last longer. CCP Fozzy says it's not trivial, but with enough time and money as anything is possible, and certainly could be done. Gobbins talks about the bomber meta and their imbalance when combined with Bushes, uh, CDs equipped with microfield jump generators. Uh, Gobbin specifies that currently the Bomber Kiki Busha Opinus is necessary to counter the overpowered capital umbrellas, and that these elements should be rebalanced in tandem. Gobbins talks about hunters going after ratters by forming a roaming fleet with bombers. He says that roaming in anything else besides bombers, Kiki Moras, and Command Destroyers will likely result in the fleet getting absolutely deleted by the super capital umbrella, bows and traps, or being camped in a dead end. Gobbins hopes that the Sino changes may address this a bit, and result in some changes to the roaming fleet comps and meta. He says that stats-wise, the current hunter comps project a lot of damage at a further range than any other frigate currently can, whilst staying beyond the warp disruption range, whilst signature and speed tanking. The boosters then add additional safety by being able to jump the fleet out of any difference if the boosters are well coordinated. 
BFGs and super capitals force that additional mobility and ship, ship selection currently force this kind of meta. He mentions wormholes being used a lot for roaming, and he believes that adding an option for different kinds of ships to travel through wormholes for roaming, in addition to frigate exclusive wormholes currently in the game. In addition to this, bombers can cloak up and drop bombs, which just adds to their potency, as well as their access to covert field uh, jump portal generators. Vili adds that the Umbrella and Boucher meta are in response to another and forming a symbiotic relationship. Rise asks if they don't feel there is any other option to countering those fleets than supers. Gobbin says that Munins are effective, but they need time to form up before reacting, whereas supers and capitals plus faxes can just be instantly formed and dunk on the roaming fleet. Vili would want to see increases to the spool up time of microfield jump generators, but also wants to see a way to address the travel capabilities. Gobbins would be happy with finding a way to counter them without just adjusting the wormhole travel. Gobbins explains that other frig sized doctrines with less DPS than the bombers and Kiki are not as oppressive because their low DPS allows for a long response time by the defenders. Olmeca Gold asks for permission to interfere in this discussion and was granted. He feels that this boils down to Nullsec players wanting to have a fair response to those 200 bomber fleets, but also feels that they are not common. CCP Rise asks if the CSM has any consensus on a good way to improve this as the session is running out of time. Adjusting micro field jump generators in some way with fatigue has been brought up many times. CCP Fozzy says that adding some scatter elements to the uh, micro jump field generators to add an effective delay whilst they form up again after every jump. Changes to the range, sig radius, speed and ability to travel through wormholes was also suggested. Lastly, the re restriction of either bombs or DPS for bombers was mentioned. Dunk Dinkle says that he would rather want to see 200 people attacking one, resulting in 400 people duking it out, instead of 200 people getting content at the expense of one. He also isn't a fan of it going against one comp, because that would be chasing the tail end of the issue. Section 5, Ship Balance and the Chaos Era Part 3. This is the third meeting on balance and general meta discussions. One point that has been brought up is logistic ship balance right now, and there are some ideas being thrown around to change the diminishing returns feature to see if it can be tweaked to not impact certain communities such as incursion runners. The main concern seems to be the problems faced in wormhole space that causes small scale fights to be unbalanced. Dunk Dinkle asks the table what they consider to be the problem with logistics in their current state, and Aerith says that not enough stuff is dying. CCP Rise says that he sees a lot of feedback that there aren't enough trading kills, they are too one-sided due to logistics. Dunk Dinkle adds that a force auxiliary will instantly shift a small-scale subcapital fight. He then says that even Ospreys in a small-scale fight will just result in a stalemate. He believes that there are different use cases that require different solutions. CCP Rise reminds the CSM of other solutions that were thrown around in the past. CCB Fozzy says that it is possible to use system-wide effects, and just every couple of months select one third of Norsec regions randomly to remove remote repairs. Dunk Dinkle asks again where most of the frustration comes, and wormholes were it for sure. Losec is oppressed by a handful of groups, and that is just a form of oppression rather than due to the mechanics itself. Ixuki explains that in wormhole space, they are forced to bring a bunch of Balgorns to turn off the fax, and the only way this would result in the ship dying is if the pilot messes up their cap boosting and repair cycle. CCP Rise asks what would happen if capital cap boosters just didn't exist. He then suggests increasing the volume of 3200 cap boosters but there wouldn't be there would be solutions such as deep space transport spam. Olmeca Gold suggests taking away cap boosters from faxes, but then increasing the local capacitor instead. Dunk Dinkle says that this would only fix one issue and not affect remote repairs. Ixuki asks if increasing their reload time and changing some numbers to slow down how much capacitor power a fax can get. CCP Rise says that they can just add, a mod add the module to the list of one equipped per ship. 
CCB Rise backs up a bit and asks what their gut feeling would be about affecting engagements when disabling remote repair. Overall, and Nomina and Aerith would think that this would make more fights happen, they would be having a lot more fun, and even knowing they lose, they would come out ISK positive. CCB Fozzy says that in the past, they would see that people would find ways to mitigate fights, not because they're afraid of losing, but because they are afraid of feeding without getting kills. Dunk Dinkle raises a concern about being outgunned when defending, and that this would remove one of their force multipliers. With this change, he believes that he would take fewer fights, whereas Exuki and Aerith believe that they would take more. Vili does point out that this may result in Nano Crappery coming back. Aerith asks Dunk Dinkle if he would engage 20 Slepnirs in 20 Thoraxes, he would come out ISK positive by just killing three of them. Dunk Dinkle doesn't want that, he wants the hostiles to get the hell out of his system. There seems to be a very unhealthy state enabled by logistics to go into a fight and lose nothing and destroy everything. Aerith points out that Dunk Dinkle can zerg, but he says he can't. There is now a huge political debate, read argument, between Aerith and Dunk Dinkle about fighting and risk aversion, not wanting to feed, the demoralising aspect of repeatedly going out in random cheap ships to combat the attacker, all while Dunk Dinkle is outnumbered. CCP Spider is confused. Olmeca Gold brings up the RTS Turtle argument again, and Dunk Dinkle says that not turtling has caused him to get kicked out of a bunch of regions. Now they are talking about zerging again, and trying to identify whether this isn't possible right now anyway. Aerith says that Dunk Dinkle is so paranoid of being farmed that he doesn't want to fight at all. Dunk Dinkle argues that farming causes people to leave. Exuki brings some sense into the conversation and points out that a fax causes this to not be fun right now, a fax shows up on the grid and everyone bounces anyway. Now the discussion is back to the fact that there is no counter to the current system, nor would there be a noticeable change with removing logistics. CCP Rise finally saves my fingers and steps in and says that Aerith is right, and if there is a chance of losing, then they are going to try and get kills, and logistics prevent that right now. Innominate then points out that the views of Dunk Dinkle are not to get the good fights, but rather his ability to defend space. Aerith changes the scenario from a defensive one to a hypothetical situation where two fleets would bump into each other in Nullsec, and Dunk Dinkle agrees that this would be more fun and result in a good brawl, even if his side knew they were fighting a losing fight. The defensive aspect is a punch to the gut. CCB Rise points out that there is going to be less interest in being in, being in a losing fight, regardless of the scenario. Izuki thinks in many cases that the force multiplier is too high, and no one disagrees with this statement. This is also the same conclusion that CCP has had, we could totally turn the diminishing returns dial and see if we can hit a balance. Dunk Dinkle argued vehemently against turning off remote repair entirely, and it's the only reason that's not going to be implemented. In reality, this entire discussion about actually removing logistics was not serious. CCP understands that removing an entire profession just isn't viable. Dunk Dinkle says that tweaking the numbers would be ideal. Vili asks if there's any way to change these with capital reps on non-capitals and so on. He suggests having it be based on signature resolution, but CCP Fozzy and CCP Rise say that this is not a trivial thing. But it is something that they've discussed. Ixuki mentions that as soon as the fax has a lock on the ship, he can then forget about breaking the tank in the small scale he fights. CCB Fozzy says that this is the scale where anti-logistics electronic warfare would be viable as a mechanic. Corbins asks about cha changing the cap to repairs received, maximum rep received before diminishing returns for a limited time, a week, as part of the chaos experiments. Omeka Gold brings up the chaos era and says that the risk has increased but the rewards don't match this change and asks if CCP would consider increasing the rewards, since the economy allows for it more now. CCP Fozzy thinks that there is definitely stuff they could do in that regard. He also mentions that there is no agreement on what amount the ISK force it should be in the game, and that this is not a trivial matter to clarify either. Aerith brings up that CCP needs to decide if the blackout is staying before they met start messing around with reward systems. Steve Renukin suggests having some specific stations paying more for the Overseer's loot. 
CCB Rise brings up that there are also alternative options, such as item rewards rather than ISK, and the faucet is not the only tool that they have. Innominant mentions as a joke having the NPCs drop minerals instead of bounties. CCB Fozzy says that there has been an idea discussed a couple of times to replace bounties with tags. Merkel Chen asks if they could switch out the drones on one of the Nurgle for 5 kilometers of range to the guns. CCP Rise says no. CCP Fozzy starts a sentence with hypothetically and suggests random chaotic space weather effects such as negative 75% rep effectiveness. The CSM likes the idea. He then asks what kind of weather effects they would want to see. Agility was brought up, but they don't want to mess with anything like mining yield or damage amount. Warp speed, sinos, bushing, disabling cloaking, capacitor efficiency is all something that could be considered. Dunk Dinkle suggests no MWD, no bubbles, bigger bomb radius, no lullification. Exuki <laughs> brings up a list of about 350 suggestions he's been sitting on for this exact kind of idea. Uh, Arith brings up a standing reversal system dubbed the Space Madness, so spa players gain standings by killing NPCs rather than lose them. A 1 meter radius bomb with 10 times the damage was brought up. CCB Fozzy asks what the size of these effects should be, and constellation wide effects were agreed to be more comfortable than an entire region. Ixuki brings up an example of avoiding systems with certain doctrines during PvP in wormhole space, and this is a dynamic that could cross over to known space. CCB Rise confirms that he heard about a request to rebalance the primae. Section 6, Wormholes. Ixuki brings up a, on the screen a presentation for the CSM members and CCP is present in the room to talk about wormholes. Ixuki says that all the data he presents is a form of combination from a survey he sent out, which received just shy of a thousand responses and personal experience. He does not claim to have perfect data for all of wormhole space, and his numbers should not be taken as statistical facts. As of now, wormhole space accounts for about 7% of the player base, but accounts for 12% of all kills in EVE, and is on an upward trend. Ixuki points out that on average about 12 trillion ISKs comes in as a faucet from wormhole space. The political landscape of wormhole space is m run mostly by five corporations, that have a strong hold on high-class systems. 97% of high-class wormhole space is a farm, with very few actually living there. Only one corporation lives in a C6 wormhole. Low-class wormhole space is busier. There are many smaller corps populating it, and some are used to farm, but Ixuki admits that they are difficult to differentiate from just a standard small corporation living there. It is very uncommon to see alliances in wormhole space, if the Alliance mates want to live there, they may as well be in the same corporation. CCB Fozzy asks what Ixuki thinks is the distribution of low-class wormhole systems where people use for them for their home base, and Ixuki says that it's mostly in C2 to C4 systems. Ixuki mentions that there are long-standing grudges between some of the groups in wormhole space, notably the Russians being involved. There's a lot of frenemies there, where one night two groups will brawl it out, and then the following day they will call them to get more pilots on field to kill some ship they caught. Aerith wonders what her wormholers would do to counter an alliance that decided to just store 1,000 characters in battleships in the most coveted wormholes to mess with the people living there. Ixuki says there's nothing stopping him from doing this, but it would take a very long time to get that set up. The majority of wormhole space players live in low-class holes, one-fourth of those living in a low-class wormhole system to hunt players in Nullsec. Players live there to avoid hostile capital usage, easier training environment, multiple statics, easier access known space, and because they consider their corporation too small for high-class wormhole systems. Only 33% of low-class players PvE in low-class space. 35% of players live in high-class space to use capitals for PvP, easier rolling of wormholes, PvE is better, their corporation is too large for low-class system to support them. Regardless of class, 70% of players have a static C5 system in their home. Aerith asks what Ixuki thinks of the idea of wormhole stabilizers. Ixuki says that depends on exactly how they would be implemented. Ixuki says that just having a super wormhole with more mass would be an interesting approach, 
as long as it's entirely random. Aerith mentions having a, having a hole with no mass limits that lasts for a week. CCB Muppet Hunter says that some element of counterplay would be ideal for these kinds of game mechanics. Aerith thinks that the drawbridge mentality currently taking place in wormhole systems is detrimental to some good fights actually happening. Ixuki goes over the most popular PvE setups and how to dra handle the drifter spawns in each case. Using an Astra House to dunk on the drifter is by far the most common tactic. Ixuki points out that in farm systems, there are only a couple of hours a week where there is any life. Gobbins asks what's the most common way for wormhole PvE setups to fail and die. The most common cause is a disconnection. There are very few people who have fleets sitting in these systems logged off to catch people. The second most common cause is pilot error. Ruling out a disconnect or pilot error, it is 100% safe to perform these isk making activities. Ixuki says that whilst he does not have any data to back it up, he is convinced that wormholes are the safest space in EVE. He quantifies this by comparing the amount of isk made versus isk lost. Gobbins, with the reflexes of a true gunslinger, asks what the appropriate ballpark of isk per hour is for these three most common setups. Jewel, Nesta, Rattlesnake and Lashax would be about 1.2 billion isk an hour, assuming the Drifter is killed too, and the Triple Dreadnought set setup is about 2 billion isk an hour. Ixuki shows that his survey sees 36% of the players will be farming alone, 13% will do it with one other person, and the rest is fleets that are likely to be quite inefficient from an isk gained per user perspective. The main reason for this is to maximize individual profits as it's most efficient. 50% of players only harvest core reservoirs due to the low value of non-core sites. 25% of miners mine the mining anomalies and the rest mine moons. Data sites are only touched by 30% of players, the rest don't bother due to a low power payout, particularly when compared to the ISK payout from the combat sites. Main PvP metas are armor brawling compositions in Tech 3 cruisers and Lashax. The wormhole space population is divided on the recent facts balance. Large groups are thinking they are balanced, whilst small groups still find them impossible to deal with. CCB Rise asks if the latest nerf round didn't change this. Weapons that do not require capacitor and passive tanks are common due to energy neutralizers defining the landscape. Lashax are often utilized due to their efficient usage of cap boosters. Otherwise, heavy assault missile legions and Lokis are most common. Most fights are consensual fights where both for sides formed purely for the intention of fighting the other. Wormhole corporations are rarely fighting over anything in particular, outside of evictions. The shacks as the entire fleet are becoming less common due to counters such as pilgrims becoming mainstream. Breaking their weapon spool cycle mitigates a lot of the DPS, and one pilgrim pilot can just cycle their tracking disruptors through the shacks on the field. Ixuki would want to see capital reps' efficiency applying to subcapitals be changed. He then shows his last side with suggestions. Remove the Astra House farming capabilities from the Drifter boss. Add more statics present in each wormhole system. Increasing the wandering wormhole spawn rate, such as direct wormhole to wormhole. Increase the usage of wormhole materials to run, incentivize running the currently ignored sites and changes to wormhole spawning mechanics to stop sealing up for systems, the drawbridge an analogy mentioned earlier. Ixuki asks if CCP has any idea how many wormhole systems are never entered, and they don't have that data at hand. Omeka Gold asks if adding more warp disrupting NPCs to high class wormhole sites would be a good way to deal with the micro jump drive safety net in the current meta. Ixuki feels that this is just applying a band aid to the situation, and the problem is just how easy it is to know when someone enters a wormhole system. Ixuki believes that changes making finding farmers far more common, as well as making it harder for farmers to seal themselves up, would go farther than making some rats stop MJDs. CCP Rise asks why Astra House farming is so high on the list, and finds it unusual that players would be requesting a change that impacts their income rates. Ixuki suspects that players doing this would want to take a small hit to their isk per hour in exchange for more chances to find fights. CCB Sledgehammer asks for clarification on why C4s are not viable. Ixuki explains that the main NPC spawn points for the sites are too far away from each other, and that's the main issue. 
The remote repairs for NP the NPCs are also more than what can be found in C5s, meaning that anyone who can run a site in a C4 system can then run them just as easily in C5s, or alternatively go and run sites in C3s, which are more ISC efficient. Section 7, API Session 1. CCP Bartender explains that the two API sessions will be a bit experimental, and he wants to have a pair of documents generated from this. He wants a clear idea on what the API should and should not be doing from the gameplay perspective. He wants to make it clear that this is to create a thought-guiding document, and does not necessarily mean that anything from this will be added. This ended up being a list of key goals and anti-goals, which I'll go through now. API key goals, number one, to balance towards content catalysts, number two, accessibility for non-programmers, and three, reducing management overhead. Speculative goals that were not strong enough to be added to the list or were added to different, in different forms include reducing tedium, scale, and content catalysts. On the other hand, API key anti-goals, number one, never lie, and number two, avoid undermining core gameplay. Speculative anti-goals that were not strong enough to be added to the list or were added in different form include free intel on other organizations, remote intel, content killers, and programmers as a force multiplier. Dunk Dinkle says that at the highest level there are functionalities in the game that are quite complex, having the ability to take the data out of the game, to be manipulated and then put back in the game to not deal with the challenges of the UI. He mentions that scaling for ACLs, for example, is very difficult, but having an option to do this out of game would be nice. He says that even if a player understands how the system works, it will still involve a lot of manual work. Dunk Dinkle mentions static data extracts not being released with every release, and that people are typically hungering for that to be updated. CCP Bartender said that this is outside of the scope of the session, but they can get that data live from the ESI. He then mentions that he wants to focus on the GP aspect, general programming. He asks if there's anything else w anyone would add to the anti-goals. Innominate says that you should not be getting intel from other organizations for free. Vili says that he can look at any system in EVE and see the timer in that system. It should only be available to what the ones involved in the conflict, specifically referring to the Intosis timers. He calls this a content killer. Gobbins mentions that map statistics for NPC kills and ship losses is an anti-goal. CCP Bartender says that this is information in the game that the ESI re relies on. However, ESI allows for this to be monitored consistently 24-7. He also brings up reports being used to monitor activity in wormholes. Ixuki says that this is a content catalyst. Arith nods in agreement. CCP Bartender says that both of these examples are suggestive of something happening in the system that still requires in-game verification. Hikzuki says that the system doesn't need to be specific as to what people are flying, but only getting a notification of a player presence. Anomina asks if CCP has found that Z Killboard is being relied on too much by the game. He notes that the blackout happened and Z Killboard made a change that had a substantial impact on the game. CCP Bartender says that there are a lot of groups that do this, such as Dotlan and Tripwire. CCP Bartender says that CCP wouldn't tell players who they should trust, it just so happens that the entire player base has put their trust in Z Killboard, and CCP Bartender wonders whether they should be taking some power out of players' hands and inserting in some, some sort of agency. Section 7, API Session 1. CCP Bartender explains that the two API sessions will be a bit experimental, and he wants to have a pair of documents generated from this. He wants a clear idea on what the API should and should not be doing from the gameplay perspective. He wants to make it clear that this is to create a thought-guiding document, and does not necessarily mean that anything from this will be added. This ended up being a list of key goals and anti-goals, which I'll go through now. API key goals, number one, to balance towards content catalysts, number two, accessibility for non-programmers, and three, reducing management overhead. Speculative goals that were not strong enough to be added to the list or were added to different in different forms include reducing tedium, scale, and content catalysts. 
On the other hand, API key anti-goals. Number one, never lie. And number two, avoid undermining core gameplay. Speculative anti-goals that were not strong enough to be added to the list or were added in different form include free intel on other organizations, remote intel, content killers, and programmers as a force multiplier. Section 8, API Session 2. CCB Bartender has been pondering on the goals and anti-goals that were generated in the last meeting, and he doesn't believe that any of the stated anti-goals are currently being violated. Therefore, he would like to focus on the goals. The plan is to go over the list and identify the best bang for the buck changes that can be made. Steve Renukin suggests inf increasing the information available on structures. CCP Bartender says that having docking rights on various structures is kind of a surrogate to get information on various systems, and that structures are a proxy for industry indexes through this method. Steve Renukin and Arith would both like to see structure fittings, specifically rigs. CCB Bartender mentions that some of the SOV endpoints already have an aggregate level for the ADM levels. There has been some discussion of adding industry job costs on structures. Steve Renukin and CCB Bartender talk about a sensible way to determine public structures that allow manufacturing. CCB Bartender wants to show the bonuses rather than what specific ribs are equipped with. A discussion was had on how some information would be displayed, but it was decided that this would be easier to determine later down the line. Arith and Steve Renukin request ACL, Access Control List Management, at the very least a read-write access. CCP Bartender says that write access is a difficult thing to implement as it is extremely cost-heavy and will send an insane amount of queries that have crashed the server during testing each time. Seeing which ACL a player is an admin on, Seeing what's on a specific ACL are relatively easy tasks. However, updating the ACL would be extremely difficult because it, because, because it can be used to cause time dilation. Dunk Dinkle asks how easy it is to see which ACL applies to a specific structure, and CCB Bartender replies that it's relatively easy. Omeka Gold says that they use the in game indexes for industrial activity to find miners easily, but this is not available out of the game. He would like to see this feature on Dotlan. Steve Renukin says that the map does not currently show when someone is actively mining, but this implementation would show that. CCB Bartender asks if this is considered a catalyst or not, and there seems to be a consensus that this is a catalyst. There is a concern that this would be used to determine an activity within uh, inside a wormhole, but Izuki doesn't believe so. He thinks that people would rely on existing methods. However, he wants to discuss this with other players to get a better sense of the impact. The last two suggestions that have been brought to the table are some sort of live ESI kill feed to quickly locate players to shoot at, and the possibility of sending ISK through the ESI. Section 9. The Economy. CCP Fozzy asks the room if there's anything that they want to ask. Olmeca Gold goes first and asks if there is any consensus about the optimal price of Plex or faucets and the answer is that there is none. Steve Renukin asks if there's any concerns about the economy outside of the normal stuff. CCB Fozzy replies that the main concern is botting. In general, the short answer is yes, but it's hard to answer for the company as a whole. CCB Larrikin adds that it's easier to say if something is bad rather than if something is good. Vili asks how they feel about the state of moon minerals and whether they consider that the state is better now after the patch. CCB Fozzy says that it's generally solid and they're not seeing a single giant bottleneck or something like that in their data. Vili follows up by asking if there's been any more thought to making material less, materials less region specific, and CCP Fozzy says that there is more interest within CCP in pushing towards more region specific resources rather than fewer. He explains that there is nothing on the current roadmap to change this, but rather a general interest within the company in pushing for more regional variety. Dunk Dinkle says that there, this seems to reinforce the opinion that everyone goes to Jitter and spreads out across New Eden from there. CCB Fozzy agrees with that statement. Dunk Dinkle adds that there is not really any inter-regional inter trade, but everything goes through into Jitter. Steve Renukin mentions that having variable taxes in specific regions on some specific goods. CCB Fozzy says that this is not doable with the current market code, but might be possible in the future. 
Gobbins says that when a player wants to make ISK, they will generally create it from thin air by resource collection and exploration. If we want to increase the ability for players to make ISK without burdening the game economy with new faucets, implementing more thievery mechanics would be a valuable solution. He thinks it would be interesting to boost the mechanics that allow for stealing, as it is one way in which a player's work is rewarded, but without it being another faucet. CCP Fozzy says that the ESS and Siphons were intended to be a step in that direction, and whilst their implementation was not ideal, their goals are sound. CCP Ghost asks the CSM two questions. What effect, if any, has the CSM noted from the sales and market tax spikes? Aerith says that this has had a bit of an iceberg effect, and a lot of hidden stuff was revealed when people started dumping into the market. Omeka Gold asks who is paying this tax, and CCP Fozzy says it's widely distributed for the most part. He raises another question, was this change done to affect the faucet from ratting? No, it was not a direct one-to-one -one decision. Olmeca Gold wonders if there's some way to find a sink cost for those who are ratting. CCP Larrikin says that if he has suggestions on sinks, then he can write them up and send them to CCP. It's a valuable tool to have in the toolbox. Aerith asks if the industry tax will be reviewed, and CCP Fozzy says he'd want to. Aerith Gobbins comments that from a player perspective, he didn't see much movement or change. There was a drop in general activity lately, but it's unlikely that was due to the tax, and rather the end of the login campaign and WoW Classic. Aerith says that it looks like a lot of relisters decided to stop that business due to the increases. Dunk Dinkle thinks that this is just to see the price adjusts before getting back into it. Gobbins thinks that the market velocity may also account for this too. The second question from CCB Ghost was, what is the main effect on overall gameplay from active ISK dropping in the economy? Dunk Dinkle says that for the most part, people care about plex prices dropping, and that that was a relief as they were no longer worried about not getting enough ISK to plex up. Aerith thinks that people are getting out of ISK and items into items to hold on to. Dunk Dinkle says that the only other thing that people notice is weird anomalies, like someone cashing in 30 Lokis below market value, or eagles suddenly being sold for less than build value. The CSM and CCP spent some time discussing the nature of Plex and how it fits into Eve's business model. Olmeca Gold has a theory that since injectors and carrier Rockwell buffs around the Citadel patch, the economic model has not been sustainable. The anomaly farming PvE playstyle expires in a few years. Once Nolsec PvE players acquire all the assets they want, they stop logging in even for PvE. This can be seen in the monthly economic report since January 2019 as a reduction in farming activity. CCP Fozzy points out that even before the blackout there have been nerfs that have affected the MERs since that, the start of that period. Olmeca Gold asks if there have been any changes throughout the year between player age and retention, and that has not changed. Gobbins asks about the age differences based on where players live, and the oldest players are in wormholes with Losec and Nolsec close behind. Merkel Chen asks what measurements does CCP use reliably categorize players as pilots living in high sec, null sec, etc. CCP Larrikin clarifies that it is based on where they spend most of their active time in the game. This confirms that Aerith, Merkel Chen, and Anomina are all high sec pubbies. Aerith suggests excluding Jitter from these metrics as they are probably just alts and may not accurately reflect the actual type of a player. A discussion came up on how these things are defined and there are many ways that are being mentioned. You can look at the station location they mostly dock in, or what space they fly around the most. There is also a matter of whether you take alts into account or not. CCB Larrikin comments that this is all valuable information, but Vili argues that just because he farms in wormholes and spends the majority of his time there does not make him a wormholer. CCB Larrikin disagrees. Innominate mentions that there is a notion that players are exclusive to a single area of space, and CSB Larrikin agrees with that, and that is how they view these metrics. Aerith continues to argue that Jitter is a mechanically forced location to do trade, and seems to be delighted with being called a high-sec player. There are now three different conversations happening, so I am sure this meeting is done, CSB Spider. Finally, CCB Psych asks the CSM what they think about the margin trading skill, and the CSM says that they should just delete it. 
Section 10, The Triglavian Invasion and Live Events. CCP Shreddy introduces the team. CCP Shreddy wants to talk about the second phase of the invasion first. Olmeca Gold mentions that the team has shifted over to invasions from the live events, and says that a lot of players engaged with the live events and is curious to see if there is a drop in engagement. CCP Sledgehammer says that the engagement comparison is not really worthwhile due to the availability of the content. The invasion is seeing about similar engagement as incursions. Olmeca Gold says that the new expansions and content is in EVE, that is PvE, is optional, and is curious if that is a challenge when compared to other MMOs where the reason to play is the PvE content. He summarises whether it's worth investing those hours into this content, as it is optional. Ixuki rephrases the question in a manner asking if they consider it worthwhile to work on this content based on the current engagement levels, and whether this was a worthwhile trade-off. CCP Shreddy replies that this is just difficult to compare even between the live events. Ixuki asks if there will be a Halloween event this year. Dunk Dinkle asks exactly what events they're working on, and if the lore live events were part of this team. CCP Shreddy clarifies that the invasion and all other events fall in the same category, of not necessarily being around permanently in the game, but rather to leave a permanent mark. The lore events, however, are not part of that. Dunk Dinkle says, then says that it seems regardless of what the team delivers, there will never be a case of everyone being happy. He goes on to say that everyone who runs the invasion sites really likes it, and he wants to see the invasion appearing in other locations. CCP Shreddy says that the team work wants to work on this for at least a year, since keeping the players involved and involving the content has been something CCP has struggled with in the past. CCP Shreddy continues to share that next week the invasion will be shredding to Losec too. Vili asks if it will eventually hit Nullsec, and CCP Sledgehammer says that they are in ongoing discussions about where they want to take the story. Ixuki asks about scrambling and if it will be more prominent, and CCP Sledgehammer says that they want to push the boundaries with that whilst making sure not to nuke players on the gates. CCP Shreddy goes on to explain that the invasion was heavily worked on by about seven teams with various different aspects of the invasion. Gobbins asks about the idea of an event to find and destroy roaming fleets that follow a path and attack players, but after being destroyed, they don't respawn, similar to the Soitoyo and FOBs. CCP Coyote clarifies that this was a part of the initial design for the invasions, but they encountered some issues with it specifically finding a balance between a unique moment and how players actually experience it. Gobbins mentions the issue with the Toy Toyo, and the fact that there is no point fighting the NPCs as they just keep spawning until the structure is dead, and would like to see that changed or new content created with these roaming fleets that appear all around EVE. They would see this roaming fleet as a reward, uh, with a reward for destroying them as a better alternative to the drifter attacks, they mentioned this would be something like Barbarians in Civ games. CCB Sledgehammer says that this new system is still in its infancy, but they are looking into various options with the tools to create dynamic content like this. They feel like their goals down the line are much in line with what the CSM is getting at. Dunk Dinkle asks about the incursion spawn rates going from 3 to 1 spawning at a time, and if they would consider moving them back to their original spawn rates. They're considering if they should move it back to the original rate. The reasoning being for doing this initially was the hope that incursion runners would try out the invasion. Vili asks if they've looked into why no one has moved over, and CCB Sledgehammer said that this was a sentimental matter and due to the ISK payout. He also says that incursions are just unbalanced in high sec because they are printing ISK at no risk, and that is also why they moved over to more industrial level rewards. The ninja looting in these sites was brought up, and there are arguments for and against changing this. It's considered a fundamental part of many aspects of the game, such as Soitoyo blueprint drops and so on. CCP Coyote mentions that this might balance itself out in low sec where pe when people can actually fight back. Ixuki mentions that he feels they could definitely increase the payout on the invasion sites. He feels that there is room to make them worth more, without upsetting anything, and may even make mission runners and incursion runners move over. 
Dunk Dinkle mentions the industry skills dropping being a cool factor, and this is what keeps people coming back to invasions. CCP Sledgehammer mentions that they made a conscious decision not to eat into the official Dead Space loot tables, but they could make some changes in that regard. Villy asks if the invasion will have Sino jamming. They can be run in capitals regardless of the Sino jam, but it adds a risk and reward dynamic that needs to be looked at by the team. Olmeca Gold feels that having it jammed would give more breathing room for the runners. Dunk Dinkle asks about the mining in the sites. CCP Sledgehammer says that people are mining the ore, but it is not as high as he wanted to see, mostly because the sites are still dangerous. Steve Renukin asks about the warp in range from the ore. CCP Sledgehammer says that they would be around 60 to 70 kilometers from the warp in when mining, which is sufficient time to get away the CSM feels. CCP Sledgehammer goes back to the rewards and appreciates the feedback. He said that they didn't want to rock the boat too much with this release. Merkel Chen says that they should definitely look at the faucets right now, and given the current state, it may be a good time to bump up the payout. Ixuki goes back to the live events and mentions some of the drugs and the lack of faucet for some of the boosters, and CCV Sledgehammer says that there are some of them in the LP store. Ixuki says that this has become an expensive way to stay on top in PvP. Philly asks if there are plans to add more versions to the LP store, and right now the team just wants to see what the uptake is. CCP Shreddy mentions some of the events done over the summer, like the skilling spree, and so on. He wants some feedback from the CSM. Vili says he doesn't think that nobody is ever going to be upset about getting skill points. This is definitely something more enticing for newer players, due to their low skill point level at the time. He even believes that they wouldn't hate the idea of newer or lower SP uh, players getting more skill points. Omeka Gold feels that doing so doing in-game stuff for the skill points makes most sense. Ixuki asks if it was completely random, which reward should be given each day. The rewards are, were weighted to some degree. CCP Shreddy asks if having a bucket of challenges would be good to bring back, or just to keep it simple so with a single kind of challenge. Vaili thinks that mining wouldn't be very enticing, but asks what kind of challenges they would expect. CCP Shreddy says that it could literally be anything. Gobin suggests challenges that get players to travel through gates, even if a few jumps. The more people travel, the more the game feels alive, and the higher chance of bumping into hostiles. And Ixuki believes that there is a lot of room to have some arbitrary tasks that may entice players to change their plans for the day. Omeka Gold suggests having some threshold on the cost of ship destroyed for PvP challenges. Vili has some ideas to do distribution missions or trade a commodity, get into exploration by hacking a container, activating filaments, etc. CCP Sledgehammer says that they've found players really don't like being told to go to a specific location. CCP Shreddy asks if they think they are adding too many skill points into the game, and the CSM thinks that that's getting to the point where some people may not even care about losing out on a day. However, they do like that this is making lives easier for new players, and matters much more to them. Dunk Dinkle also mentions that they should consider other rewards and not just SP. Section 11, Player Experience Improvements for Newbies. CCP Fozzy explains that the team is going to be working on improving the usability of features that players can encounter in their first 30 hours of gameplay alongside the team Psycho Sisters who are focusing on the tutorial. CCB Fozzy starts by going over what has been released already in regard to small improvements across the board. First, we see the information about the fitting warnings and what kind of warnings will be included in the system. The team joked about adding some easter eggs for this feature down the line. The help pointer will have some improvements and the simulation window will be more prominent. The skill tooltip clarifies now if it is referring to something in the cargo the player can't use. The maximum time to warp is finally being implemented. Warp UI improvements will be added to better indicate the state the player is in whilst preparing to warp. Further changes are planned. Inomina asks if the ship is bumped into the area they were intending to warp to will cause issues. The team has one defect about this right now. 
CCB Fozzy says that the text is also being updated to give more insight into the warp states. Olmeca Gold asks about a compass that shows the aligning. CCB Fozzy says that the compass is tied to the camera, not ship orientation, which makes the compass less useful for that purpose. The team is going to be making a change to the Angel of Mercy mission, which has previously caused confusion among new players. Buy All is being added as a button in the kill report. The wallet is back to the default Neocom. Repackaging containers give a special warning. Some skill tooltip changes. Thermodynamics will be removed from the default set of skills and the overheat has been removed from the right click menu if the player doesn't have the skill. Hacking modules are non-repeatable now. One big change that is coming to direct trade is a second confirmation window to prevent the Eve UI misleading you during scams. Innominate asks if it can be made so that just hitting enter will confirm it, or will there be an option to suppress this? Alternatively, only have the pop-up come up if the item is not in the trade. Modernizing the default overview was brought up, and the militia members being prioritized was requested by Olmeca Gold. CCB Fozzy says that this is something they can do. Vili inquires about what exactly they are planning to be doing, and CCB Fozzy said that they will polish what is included with the existing overview, with overviews being created by the community as an inspiration. They do, however, want to create a more simplified version and work closely with the CSM during the process. CCB Fozzy clarifies that this list is to focus on the first out 30 hours of the gameplay, but if they see opportunities to help others, then they certainly will. Attributes were brought up, and this is outside the scope, this scope of this project. CCB's bad lock does have skills and attributes listed there. Steve Renukin mentions tracking speed for guns, and CCB Fozzy says that the goal of the last set of changes to the way tracking was displayed was to make the system less misleading. It looked like you could compare tracking speed to radial velocity, but in practice that only worked if the target zig radius matched your gun's signature resolution, and to allow players to compare one gun to another directly. Vili goes into a wild frenzy and starts asking a bunch of questions in rapid succession. Has the team been exploring improvements to the career agents? CCB Fozzy says that these teach players a lot, but simultaneously it seems like oh, to be a place where a lot of players get tripped up and quit the game. Are there plans to create YouTube videos with tutorials? The Flight Academy project had exactly this main in mind, but is not maintained anymore. CCB Dopamine says that there is initiatives on this front with assistance from the community, and the potential is definitely there. Some discussion about getting this done by Twitch streamers came up, but educational YouTube videos seem to be a better platform. Vili also asks for clarification about the chat mentions that have popped up earlier. This is about highlighting names in chat to make it easier to read. Steve Renukin says that he would really want to see an app being able to use to tag people in the chat. CCB Fozzy says that they want to improve the new player experience with bounties and are considering just blocking the placement of bounties on a player under 30 days old. They are also considering just removing the wanted logo. Dunk Dinkle mentions an icon in the info window for players that is a plus and only exists there to add a bounty, which is misleading. Dunk Dinkle asks about finding some way to manage the signal to noise ratio in the rookie help channel. CCP is considering finding a way to prompt you players using localized clients to join the rookie help channel in their language. Vili mentions having some sort of rookie help channel out of the game may relieve the trolling happen there, and he suggests using Discord to somehow interact with the chat. CCP Fozzy mentions that PX has started a live chat support, and that has been working well in that regard. Vili said that this is focused on the first 30 hours, but it seems static, and how they're breaking this down and focusing on specific parts. Members of T the Team Psycho Sisters says that as an example, they are focusing on the first 10 minutes or 30 minutes, whereas Team 5 focus on the broader sense of fixing the stupid. CCB Cake Machine mentions the cliff that players face after the hand-holding part in the beginning and figuring out what to do. 
the team wants to add some goals and give players a purpose after finishing the initial tutorial. CCB continues that the answer doesn't provide any specific solution to those problems and asks if there are any plans in the pipeline for that. CCB Cake Machine responds that they have some early efforts such as removing confusion and then working on making the progression through the tutorial more smooth, however there is no specific plan as to how they will do this. Their focus is on the first 10 minutes, because this is where many players drop out, so focusing on later aspects of the tutorial would be counterproductive at this time. They've reviewed all the iterations of the tutorial, and instead of ripping out the current system and replacing it, they are going to iterate on it with the best parts from the old tutorials while avoiding the mistakes that didn't work out. There is a high level idea of how they want to go with this, they first want to focus on identifying the main pain points in the first 10 minutes and fixing those before moving on. Merkel Chen brings up the difference in retention who stays on their own and someone who joins a group, but some of the CCP devs present in the room did not see the data. Merkel Chen says that they saw this from their end, and that this was true, and CCP Burger confirmed that their data shows this as well. CCP Burger also says that having a network around a new player to help them is way more beneficial than asking in rookie help or getting bom and getting bombarded with different answers. CCP Burger then brings up a discussion from another session where they would consider the handoff, uh, the handoff point from CCP to a player group, so to speak, and this is a very interesting challenge they are, that they are looking at. Merkel Chen suggests that they need to use the data on players to determine who is likely to leave and find a suitable way to assist them. CCP Fozzy mentions that they want to add the court button back to the default Neocom and run an A-B test to see if that helps, but also as a potential larger project is to make a change to the corporation window, such as improving the flow when searching for a corp in the advert window and not finding the results. They also thought about making a reverse version of this, and make an EVE linked in kind of feature, where players make themselves available to be looked up and recruited by groups. Dunk Dinkle suggests breaking the fourth wall and telling players that a lot about EVE, a lot of EVE is about the social interactions, and joining corps and to combat the perception of scams in EVE. Olmeca Gold asks if the corp ha ad has an option for a new player friendly description and that is in there, but the CSM has issues with how much that new system is abused. CCP Verga mentions that they could do an email journey for new players with an initial welcome message for recruitment, and found that day 29 was the best day to send it out. Vili suggests that having the new pilots that started around the same time be placed in a channel together. CCP Fozzy says that this is similar to a system they had considered implementing in the past, but much simpler to execute and with fewer issues. Innominate mentions that it would be worrying if that was empty on any given day. CCP Cake Machine mentions that the feedback they've gotten is that people like that feel like they're playing a single player game, because even though there are 20 people in local, they are rather invisible. They are exploring ideas on how to incentivize them to get together. Vili suggests giving a triple payout for players who do a mission together as part of the tutorial. CCP Cake Machine says they really want to find some way to get a list together of curated new player friendly corporations that are added to the top of the list in the Corp Finder and then recommended to the new player. CCP Burger says that this has paralyzed them in the past and they don't want to show bias or favoritism, but there are some very obvious candidates out there. Dunk Dinkle brings up that new players applying for the Corp aren't accepted straight away, or they need to go through extensive tests before their application is either accepted or rejected. Olmeca Gold asks if a rating system that is difficult to be abused could be added. CCP Fozzy says that this is a challenge, but if they could pull it off, it would be good. Merkel Chen points out that there is a way to do rec a recommended list of corps through metrics such as retention rate and login amount as a behind the scenes rating, this paired with acceptance rate and some perceived system would make it super hard to game. Arif points out that scamming has been mentioned a lot throughout the meeting and suggests that they should just ban scamming for rookies for 30 days. CCP Fozzy says that this is a decision for another department. Steve Renukin brings up players who sit in the rookie corps 
and that some are helpful but others are very negative and he would want to just see them moved out of the rookie corpse. Merkel Chen asks about a com concept of a new tutorial mission intro shown in the last summit, and CCP Mischief explains that they stopped because creating it in a level of quality where they would be happy with would be too time consuming with the tools available, and the team would have to tackle other parts of the tutorial that followed anyway. Section 12, Ship Index. CCP Psych is asking about the feedback of new agency. CSM paused and started sharing their perspective. It is good for new players, but veterans are not the target. What are the ship indexes? It is an easy way for new players to identify ship strengths and weaknesses. Right now, the number of information available in-game is overwhelming for new players to understand how good the hull is. The project is in the very early stages, but work has already started. CCB Psych is showing inspirations from the gaming industry they were investigating for this project, and presents early mock-ups as to how it could look in EVE Online. CCP is attempting to mask the complexity and present something that is more translatable to gameplay and more understandable for players. CCP Psych talks about good industry practice where a system like this exists in every other game with PvP. He mentions that the current implementation in EVE could be considered the ship characteristics, but it is not quite where they want this to be. He wants to expand this with statistics similar to the control bars shown in previous EVE tournaments. He shows an example of how this would be visualised and how it takes player skills into account as well as showing the maximum potential of the ship. Omega Gold asks if they will be using the stats for fit ships or unfit. CCB Psych mentions that this will be for unfit ships, due to the variations associated with the fittings and different roles the ships is being used for. He uses Dota as an example where a hero could be used for a different purpose other than their intended slash suggested role, depending on what items are used. There will be a fitting versatility index, however, that will indicate the options the player will have for the ship. CCB Psych says that this will not be a perfect system, no such system exists. He goes on to say that he wants to give the perceived idea of it being a perfect system and making clear how the ships stack up. He then pulls up the vision for the ship index's project, which covers the points brought up earlier in this session. Dunk Dinkle mentions that he is thinking like an experienced EVE player, but this will be an issue for new players to determine the basics of short range ship versus long range ship, shield versus armor tank, and so on. CCB Psych says that this started as an internal tool for balancing, and he is going to go through the thought process of how they ended up here. CCP needed a way to quickly spot issues and identify edge cases. He mentions an example of seeing a ship being too slow, finding out what an increase it, it to speed would do versus changing the mass to make it better with afterburners, but worse with MWD, and seeing how the balance is after that. They don't currently have an easy way to do that. Dunk Dinkle still makes an argument that there needs to be a high level, this ship uses missiles, don't put lasers on it. CCP Muppet Hunter chimes in and says that these are effectively two different systems that are being discussed that are not specific to the index, but he says Dunk Dinkle is absolutely right, this information needs to be clearer. Steve Renukin says that the information is already there, but it's a new UX issue. CCB Psych confirms that they want to solve this aspect too. CCB Psych says that the system will allow for a more specific breakdown of each index. Selecting the damage index will show that the ship is good with missiles but not turrets. CCB Muppet Hunter mentions that the concerns Dunk Dinkle has are being tackled by efforts from multiple teams, such as the fitting warning system. Dunk Dinkle goes to the whiteboard and draws up how the UX should be in his mind, and CCP Psych says that it, that is exactly how it will look. Dunk Dinkle asks if there is any other game that would need to hover over stats to see them. CCP Muppet Hunter says UX doesn't make it obvious that you can hover over it is bad UX. Villy wonders what the longevity of the system is, and there are some discussions about that. Innomina asks if this is the best use of dev time. 
CCB Muppet Hunter says that this is just forward-facing stuff for a tool that is required and is industry standard. This makes creating new ships and balancing existing ones more efficient, and this calmed down Innominate and Aerith. Dunk Dinkle wants to see a scenario where the game presents to players immediately what each ship is used for so they don't have to ask a veteran what ship to get for mining or exploration. Vili backs Dunk Dinkle on this part and wants to see an even higher level, a more presentable way to say this is a mining ship, this is a ratting ship. CCP Muppet Hunter mentions that this is something CCP is certainly aware of and they have an idea of how to address this via the market interface. CCP Psych moves the conversation to the behind the scenes aspect of this tool. This system only gives them theoretical information about what ship each ship is best at, but then the community takes the ship and fits with it XYZ and it becomes a totally different ship. Aerith asks why they don't just pull kill reports to determine what the ship is being used for, and CCP Psych says this is a data driven approach that has already been discussed and hopefully will be initiated after the system is in place. Vili raises concerns about the algorithm being used and that it does not take into consideration that all ships require prop mods and tackle when calculating how well each ship will tank. CCP Muppet Hunter says this is something that they do need to take into account. CCP Psych says, explains that this information is intended to not consider the meta in such a manner, but rather just the best possible shield tank achievable on these ships to compare them to each other. He does know that no one would realistically shield tank a Damovic or a Punisher in practice. Gobbin suggests a better way to visualise the graph for internal use. CCP Psych says that this requires a reference that they don't have and need to dig into this further. CCP Psych goes through some different examples of ways to represent the data internally. Vili spots that some graphs are odd, and CCP Psych says that some are older versions that don't take into account ship bonuses and they will do that in the future. Ixuki asks why sensors are in the defense index, and that is due to ECM countering. CCP Psych goes on to say that they are going to be creating these algorithms for every single stat for the ship, and they will need to determine where each stat belongs in, an, in the index. Dunk Dinkle says even with this information, there are subtle aspects that won't be explained as to why a specific ship is better. For example, why it's always a Munin. CCP Psych says that this tool is not to do that, the objective is to not make stupid decisions, but rather have a way to identify and solve some easy issues. This is to be an indication and not a catch-all final solution. Omega Gold asks for clarification on CCP Psych, saying that they use fittings in this. He explains that they will use a reference module for each specific stat, and that is why this is an indication rather than a perfect model. Olmeca Gold mentions that fittings are the most important thing to have on a ship, and this should be considered, and then him and CCB Psych talk about comparing EVE to a MOBA with this kind of system, and Psych says that MOBAs scale within the play session by changing your item build, while in EVE you make a fit decision before you go out there and you have to live with it, and this was only used as an example. Section 13, Playstyle Diversity in EVE. The CSM requested this session to talk about playstyle diversity and some of the possible changes or solutions to the less popular playstyles. Gobbin starts by saying that he and the CSM believe that increasing the diversity of playstyles will help with the growth of the game. The idea here is that all players can find their niche rather than being forced into the current limited set of viable playstyles. Gobbins goes on to say that a lot of playstyles through the years haven't received much attention and cannot compete with others due to low ISK generated or other factors. Gobbins asks what CCP thinks makes a playstyle viable. CCP Muppet Hunter says that a simple high level answer is that it must have a play, a counterplay, not making other players leave the game, and being relatively rewarding. General aspiration, progression, and mastery is also a driving factor, however this is not presented very well in the game right now. CCP Muppet Hunter mentions an example of how easy it is to define a level in WoW, but in EVE a level 2 agent does not indicate the player level. This is stuff that needs to be polished up and changed in EVE. Gobbin says that this should extend to a group level to see the progression or level that they are at. CCP Muppet Hunter replies that on the scale of priorities and simplicity, they will focus on individuals first. 
CCB Berger mentions the old certificate system, which was quite silly, being a special ops gave no indication of what it was doing, but it at least gave him a sense of purpose and a goal when he started playing. He says that now the activity tracker and the agency answer what have I done and what can I do, but they, def they, need they can definitely work more on this philosophy. CCB Muppet Hunter says that in addition to these tools, they wanted to look at achievements that can be made visible. A player will look at you and see that you killed a titan or mined a certain amount of ore, for the, and for this to become a way to define the player that doesn't currently exist in a good state in EVE, but other games do this. The medal system was mentioned, but it is such a manual system, and you have to go and want to see, go look for them. Gobbins brings up the empire building playstyle versus the aggressive nomadic one. The empire builders will wake up and play the game and see the progress of the group as a whole and the goals for the next week, month or a year are clear for the group and individuals. Gobbins brings up the old passive moon mining system that created goals for roaming alliances at a group level, such as going to war to capture valuable moons in another area. He continues that in order for gameplay to be viable, it has to go beyond having a plan for today and has to allow for goals. This goal generation for the nomadic playstyle is severely lacking since passive moon mining was removed. Likewise, a lot of currently neglected playstyles lack options for group level goal setting. Lastly, Gobbins explains that he is not advocating for a return of passive moon mining but using it as an example of how a playstyle is carried by the mechanics which generate group level goals for that playstyle. CCB Burger thinks this is a very interesting point and he says it's no secret that the more active and aggressive playstyles definitely do get more attention from CCP. He mentions that new developers will come in and talk about mining negatively but it is the backbone of the game despite not being addressed. Steve Renukin says that right now there is no public vision and that makes it difficult to make plans. Aerith says that CCP Seagull had a vision, but right now CCP seems to be throwing things at a wall and seeing what sticks. The CSM as a whole does not like the idea of having not having any vision. This missing element is a perception throughout the player base which is discouraging. Aerith says that right now the situation is making him think of weathering the storm and just going blue because they have nothing fight to fight for. Merkel Chen brings up an earlier conversation with CCB Burger and CCB Helmar and the image of the Titan Blob. He makes an analogy of how these Titans are like the endgame raids in WoW, and he only thinks that these 1000 Titans in the image are 1000 subscriptions that were there due to a purpose and a goal. He goes on to say that CCP must delete the raw call tomorrow if they don't want to see this just being the norm. He then brings up the blackout and how it's only just wolves fighting wolves, and that the only benefit that has come from it is the monthly economic report has been fixed, but as a nominate put it, it's like going to chemotherapy to deal with a sinus infection. Olmeca Gold says that on the highest level, EVE is just an ongoing RTS game, and what CCP did with the raw calls and injectors they gave some players plus 600 in their economy in the in the RTS analogy. Olmeca Gold goes, goes on to explain that just like in RTS games, there are players who like to use different playstyles, being aggressive, semi-aggressive, or turtling. CCP has made it very effective to just turtle. The Imperium alone has 10,000 supers now. Having these ships alone is not the problem, but they need to be fighting each other and put to use in general. Aerith says that right now they are in the situation of either going on the offensive and just burn a region with no resistance, or sit back, turtle and stagnate, and he doesn't want either of those. They are in a situation where he doesn't make plans beyond two years, and it's not a good one. They may be the last man standing, but they will be the last man standing. Dunk Dinkles says that the game is one of morale and emotion, wars of over morale and achievements of four emotion. He carries on saying that getting a super carrier or a titan was a pinnacle of player emotion. Now there are all these people who have achieved an important milestone and are proud of it. That being said, he goes on to talk about the future. He wants to see CCP go out and say, we are going to do this new thing and give the players new goals. Vili adds that getting a titan was not only a goal, but also a necessity. He says that nothing was worse than being rooted out of your Nullsec home because you don't have the requisite super capitals. Innominate says that their situation is rather new because back in the day, they were getting dunked on by these player blobs 
and they decide to build all the super capitals in response. Aerith says that they may have overreacted a little. Dunk Dinkle goes back to his original point and says that CCP needs to give new goals since in the 16 years players have basically achieved them all. CCP Muppet Hunter says there is a problem of balance that needs to be resolved. These issues are not on the players but on CCP. He says that it is not, in his opinion, a problem that they are taking away aspirational goals from one group but not the other. The problem is that there are no aspirational goals for both sides. He says that creating the, these new goals is not going to happen first, but they do need to do this. CCP Muppet Hunter addresses the turtling and says that this, in general, is a cheesy way to make money, and this could be due to removing the passive way of making money, and the fact you can't make money by engaging in PvP. Gobbins and Aerith says there needs to be a money tree in the game that is worth fighting for. Omeka Gold brings up the RTS model and how that applies to the high level Nullsec players. He then mentions the drifter attacks and how they didn't give rewards. CCP Muppet Hunter says this is a matter of balance and definitely CC something CCP can do better in the future. Omeka Gold moves on to talk about the bottom line being that the more playstyles there are in the game that remain viable, the more players there will be in the game. The current state is that for the previous years a lot of playstyles have been diminished due to a lack of maintenance. He brings up an example of the DED runner hunting in the drone regions, but it slowly died due to proliferation. Jackpot exploration died with the removal of faction POS blueprints. The same happened with augmented drones, which was destroyed by the release of the excavator mining drones. The removal of POSs resulted in not finding those abandoned anymore. He suggests having a list of these niche playstyles and taking care of them. CCP Muppet Hunter would very much like to see a list of these playstyles with a short description. Omeka Gold feels like there are a lot of small changes that could be made to make these playstyles viable. Innominate mentions that not all playstyles are created equal, such as high sec war declarations that are a drain to the game. CCP Burger mentions that the thing that scares him about the Titan image is that they don't move and when they do, it, everyone else runs. He mentions that in this scenario, at this level, loss has no meaning and death is not a serious matter, and CCP has lost that aspect of the game. CCP Muppet Hunter says that CCP is moving towards supporting different playstyles better, but this will take time. Anominat says that just any action is needed right now. Omeka Gold said that CCP needs to act sooner rather than later before it's too late. Vili says that the bigger issue that they are hitting on here is that there is no hope, and with no hope, roadmap, or sign of a plan, then people will just give up and leave. The only change that has happened lately is the minor venture change in regard to faction warfare, and right now the only hope players have is that CCP leaves them alone. CCP Muppet Hunter says there is a plan to get a team together to hit the smaller nails like the venture changes and address this. Steve Renukin says that there are four player definitions, leaders, fo enablers, followers, and lone wolves. The first two are important to create the followers, and without them they just burn out and leave the, to join a group that has them. Aerith says that there are no tools provided by CCP that make it easier for the little guy. Section 14, CCP Helmar AMA. Dunk Dinkle starts the session with a question about the modified Maslow's hierarchy of needs for EVE Online. CCP Helmar explains that it has been created to help people across the organization stay focused on what is important and prioritize better. This model has been very good to help frame the conversations at CCP. In addition, it helps people from different disciplines understand conversations that are taking place on a daily basis. New processes and structures have been introduced at CCP back in May to help guide the people across the company and help decide what should be on the radar. Merkel Chen asks about the execution of the recent Chaos Era items that demonstrated faster iterations and more aggressive frequency. It is becoming very difficult to be a game developer nowadays due to constant scrutiny and criticism from the outside world, says CCP Helmer. This often leads to being hesitant to make decisions and can be considered as a factor to some of the stagnation in EVE Online. CCP Helmar believes that being more responsive and acting fast, we can get to a better place much faster. Gobbins says that with faster iteration, you need to have teams that have time allocated specifically to respond. CCP Helmar agrees and says that this is a part of CCP's change of mindset. 
Sino changes are a good example of a change that can be done fast and have a big impact on the players across New Eden. Merkel Chen asks CCB Helmar about his opinion on the blackout. There is a lot of data that can be read in a variety of ways, and CCP does not want to jump into conclusions without taking enough time to review it. The changes have certainly impacted botting positively in a significant way. Arith is asking if the data on NullSec that has been presented to the CSM earlier in this week is concerning to CCP Helmar. Yes, it is a concern in a few ways. First, it seems to be a region that sees more PvE farming than previously thought. Innominate mentions that Nolsec is full of communities that formed and are fighting each other, but on the other hand he reports that there are many players completely disconnecting from the game. Nolsec changed and is a different place than it was. The question is what to do about it. Omega Gold shares, as a representative of the Hunters, that players from his group have been very pleased with the blackout changes. What worries him is the fast iteration and testing being done to increase risk without anything being done on the reward side. This will make people to permanently leave the game, as opposed to trying to play under the new rules. He urges CCP to ensure that they give themselves enough time to do everything. CCP Helmar responds that they are absolutely thinking about this. Due to years of content, EVE got more complex than before, and it puts people off. There is, however, a legion of new people who relentlessly keep trying to start their adventure in New Eden. Improving the system to make it easier for people to start will be a strong factor to impact the stagnation in some areas of space. CCP is developing EVE Online with growth in mind. Dunk Dinkle changes the topic to ask about the perception that things are being taken away from players, which is concerning, and moves to mention the FanFest home stream with Titans. He is making the point that right now the messaging from CCP lacks hope or the idea of an idea that players can collapse onto. They need a direction that will keep them engaged. Stephen Nukin comments that there is too much uncertainty. Dunk Dinkle follows with a point that they, as leaders of groups, need something to put in front of the players. CCP hears the message loud and clear. The intensity of changes and environmental stress forced players to group together. They did not understand the rules of the game anymore and falling back to their safe environment was the best defensive move. It feels that over a month there is no concrete next step. Merkel Chen makes a point that the 80-20 split of focus towards new players at CCP feels more like 97-3. He also states that it is easier to retain players than to hope to gain new ones. Other members join the conversation to add that there is a danger of an influx, the, that the influx of new players will bleed out after a short duration. CCP Helmar agrees with the statement about the players, but stresses the importance that after 16 years it is imperative to get a new generation into the game in order to set EVE Online to outlive us all. There are many fundamental issues, such as suboptimal UX and UI that is below industry standard. This will not inspire anyone to join EVE Online in 2020. Blackout is an example of an evidence-based development strategy that CCP has been operating under lately. Dunk Dinkle raises the concern that, after several days, the best methods to remain, retain new players is for them to join a corporation. His concerns are that the individuals who have a significant impact on the new players need a vision, goal, or something that will stop them from becoming bitter and jaded. He feels like his bag of tricks to keep people engaged is running low. Arith urges CCP Helmar to reevaluate internal policies to help CCPers not be afraid to play EVE Online. He agrees that the ancient policy from 2003 needs to be changed, as their fear is misguided. CSM appreciates that CCP is listening to their expertise and feedback, but they would love to talk to more CCPers that personally experienced what they are talking about. Anomina adds that they have spoken to a lot of people in CCP that do not play on a regular basis, but it is always in a tiny corporation, and only lets them see a fraction of the full experience that players have. Olmeca Gold brought up a point about survival bias, and a hypothesis is the only kind of people who would say, I am going to get 500 titans to defend my safes, survived up until this moment, natural selection, says Arith, because all the other offensive playstyles just diverged, which causes an issue. Olmeca Gold is a person who complains about capitals, but he is at peace with how many capitals there is, as long as they get destroyed. CCB Helmar comments that so many people survive the early game that only a certain type of people goes through and they dictate what follows. 
He then tells an anecdote about Abram Wald, who was examining the distribution of damage to aircraft returning after flying missions to provide advice on how to lower the bomber losses to enemy fire. This is the problem with EVE. We come together with the ultimate survivors, and you have enormous influence over CCP when talking about the game and players' needs, and thus CCP ends up with no imagination beyond what the current survivors want. This is why CCP needs to go back to the very beginning and understand you ha when you have a one-dimensional Excel sheet as your overview and a local chat as the Intel tool, that this will determine what the game will become more than anything else because the initial conditions dictate the outcome. Therefore, is no, if no choice change is done to the source input of new players into the system, there isn't really anything CCP can do to the survivors. They can give armor plating to players to repair the holes, but these are not the holes that are killing EVE Online. Anominate thinks that nobody here would argue that dedicating a lot of resources to bringing new players in the game is an excellent thing, but that does not necessarily mean that CCP needs to clear out the old players. CCP Helmar assures them that this is not the intent. Next, CCP Helmar draws a diagram on a whiteboard to explain the flow based on requ required skill and challenges available. The environment must provide new challenges for people. Gobbins comments that there is an important distinction between providing extra challenges and just adding extra tedium. CCP Helmar explains that the w that Eve is designed to be a difficulty mountain and that a player can decide where they want to live in EVE depending on the difficulty they are willing or capable of facing, with the added social and political slope to funnel players into the various areas of the game, whether that is high sec, null sec, or wormhole space. EVE has a lot of scalability in the social domain, and that is why it was designed the way it is. CCP Helmar says that they have not been doing a good job of keeping the scales balanced, and that the environment of the game is not challenging the veteran players to the extent that it did in the early days of the game. Gobbin says that he feels that this is a misconception based on his experiences in 2009, 2009 and that Nolsec was not actually that much harder back then. There was also far less competition for the rewards. CCP Falcon chimes in and thinks that it is not so much an intent to add more challenges and increase the difficulties and tediousness of the game, but instead to bring back the uncertainty and unexplored feeling from the older days. Dunk Dinkle says that the power of the social groups in the game makes it easier. Getting into raw calls or super carriers for ratting is not possible without a social group backing the player up, and is not something that can be achieved as a solo player. It, Olmeca Gold says that right now a new player can get to the end game of EVE much faster than before. Anominate says, what is the first question a new player asks? This game has been around for 16 years, can I still catch up? And he says that because of skill injectors, he can say the answer is yes. Olmeca Gold then says that players will achieve the end game of getting these ships, and then start to get bored. CCB Burger answers that as a player progresses in the game, the definition of their end game goals uh, will change. EVE Online is a completely different game during the first week compared to two months in when a player has, the player has joined a corporation. An analogy was brought up by Aerith that Eve is like Everest in many regards. It has go gone from this unexplored pinnacle of human achievement to now having guidelines throughout the entire mountain, with people standing in line to scale it and take a selfie, even though some may die during the journey. CCP Falcon says that the perceived difficulty of Eve is very high, but due to the infrastructure available today, it is actually very easy. CCP Helmar was very entertained by the Mount Everest analogy and says it describes the situation perfectly. He feels that CCP now need to provide the first pioneers with a Mount Olympus, because otherwise these players will just talk about the glory days of when it was so difficult to climb Mount Everest. It is not about adding challenge on top of the challenge of adding Titan Titans, but rather altering the environment to create new ones. Players will master the chaos at some point, Gobbins says it is mechanically hard to envision how to implement a Mount Olympus into the game. CCP Muppet Hunter mentions that it may not necessarily be Mount Olympus, but rather something like the Seven Summits that many of these people take on in real life. CCP Helmar says that climbing the north side of Mount Everest with no oxygen is another way to accomplish this challenge, and uses the analogy to describe the idea of a permadeath character in EVE Online as a new challenge to present to the game. 
he does admit that this is a bit of a cop-out and it's not really difficult to think of an idea like that, but it should definitely be on the table. He adds that the real challenge is in finding a way to implement the seven summits into EVE. CCB Burger says that there are some social aspects to the game that create an unpredictable nature. He says that in the environmental aspect, the game CCP does not have any challenges that they can use there. He goes back to the Mount Everest analogy and says that there are factors such as weather that the climbers need to take into consideration, and that adds a new dynamic to the situation. He says that a lot of the Chaos Era stuff is like this weather with or without any agency. He says that it is not necessarily a healthy chaos, as there is no way to master it or predict it. CCP Helmar says that in real life, people will either face political or environmental challenges. In EVE Online, the latter is missing, and players have mastered the political challenges of EVE. CCP Helmar continues to say that there are no challenges or consequences in the game right now, an example being nothing happens when a raw call fleet strips out an entire system of its ore in a day. Omeka Gold says that the Hunters of Eve are more an environmental challenge than a political one. CCB Helmar takes the conversation back to the flow diagram, and says that anything that people are interested in doing can be boiled down to a formula of the unpredictable outcome, sense of control, and frequency. He uses a real-life example of this, where people in North America used to do dance for thousands of years to make it rain, and asks the room how the concept of rain dancing occurs. There is the unpredictable outcome of when it will rain, there is the sense of control in the sense that when a human is presented with something unpredictable, they will try to understand the me mechanisms of it, and then they will dance, it will rain. But the next time they dance, it doesn't rain, and they try to adjust their dancing routine, making sure to do a dance on a Tuesday or a full moon, leading and leading to confirmation bias setting in. This results in people for thousands of years trying to figure out what causes it to rain, and this results in emergent religions and all sorts of things. CCB Helmar finishes this example by explaining that as soon as the sense of control becomes actual control, then we lose interest. CCB Helmar refers to the graph and says that veterans have gotten to the point of having total control with their infrastructure and knowing everything. They are past the point of nostalgia, However, for the new players, there is no sense of control, just utter chaos. This is something that CCP wants to address, by scaling the difficulty to the abilities of new players, and likewise getting the game to a state where, own, where the veterans only have a sense of control again. CCP Helmar talks about the idea of procedurally generated resources, and how this could cause uh, conflict and shake-up in the game, whereas the current design of resource allocation in the game currently leads to stagnation at the heart of it all. If these materials shifted throughout space in a random manner, there would be natural reasons to fight one another, and offensive mining could even be a thing. Olmeca Gold urges that CCP should listen to CCP Fozzy and CCP Rise way more, because they think they are the people who engage the most in e with EVE and the community. He thinks that this is a good vision, but this needs to be implemented in the right way. CCP Helmar says that people are challenging CCP, that they have no vision for the game, and says that this is the vision. Vili brings up concerns about the recent Drifter attacks, and how this felt like an attack on the players from CCP directly. He says that if there is to be an environmental change like CCP envisions, then it needs to be done in such a way that the player perception isn't the same again, that this is just another attack from CCP. CCP Helmar says that it is not the intent for CCP to be playing these demigods and poking at the sandbox, but unfortunately, they need to just need to start like this and allow it to evolve into the vision. The discussion ends that CCP needs to define how far they can go and what changes are acceptable, and the CSM agrees that they want to see some version of this chaos era implemented, but CCP needs to present a more concrete plan. Section 15. Team Security. CCP Nemesis starts by saying that this is more of an open dialogue session to discuss RMT and botting concerns in dissection. He wants to know what the CSM have seen lately and if there have been any noted improvements. He gives a bit of a story about how this came to be, and that surveys show that the number one concern from bot players is the botting in EVE Online. CCP Nemesis was tasked to lead this project and to tackle botting. They have additional resources and are working on tools to automate a lot of the processes so that the team can spend more time on investigations. 
they have been focusing on the most harmful effects with high ISK generation. Innominate notes that there is another side to this and that's input broadcasting and that this is an issue too and it's obvious, so obvious and flaunting the rules so much that it's infuriating. CCP Muppet Hunter clarifies that they are looking at ISK first because it's easier for CCP to fix but they don't deprioritize the minerals that they are generating too. CCP Nemesis also clarifies that lately they have changed their strategy. CCP Nemesis goes back to Anonymous Point and discusses legal multiboxing. Vili mentions a notorious broadcaster that runs roughly 20 munins that is still kicking around. Olmeca Gold says that he's watched these input broadcasters for days and sees 99% of these players use IS Boxer. For some cases, it's valuable for performance reasons when running multiple clients. He says that these aren't bots, so using the report a bot button isn't appropriate, so it's unclear how to report them. CCP Nemesis has talked about this and says botting is basically just cheating, and the report a bot button may be just need to be changed for a more appropriate name to cover these broader aspects, such as alpha account abuse, input broadcasting, exploiting, and botting. Olmeca Gold asks if reporting all the broadcast characters will allow the team to detect the connection between the accounts, and CCP Nemesis confirms that this is the case. CCP Nemesis also clarifies that a lot of proof needs to be collected and a threshold found to prove that these are non-human actions. Vili also brings up the li big offenders list and asks if broadening this list would be feasible. The team is currently working on it. Vili asks if there is action being taken against bot corpse. CCP Nemesis says that they do act on them when they find them and catch them. CCP Nemesis then says that they are that the faster they can catch them, the interest in the game from an RMT perspective lowers due to lacking profitability, and the blackout was an example that absolutely helped tackle that. Gobbins asked if they noticed in the blackout that they would move on to other activities or whilst they're waiting it out. Exuki brings up the debugger tool issue with cloaking, and CCP Nemesis says they're aware of the issue. Vili asks if there is any preference given to localization of botting, and that some space is more popular due to various factors, and whether this is taken into account, such as some regions that are renter regions being almost exclusively bots. Vili says that these botters have all kinds of stats about what gets their bots banned and work around that. CCP Larrikin asks if what is being suggested is to keep an eye out for regions that seem to be hotspots for botters, and that is what the CSM is in suggesting indeed. Gobbins asks if they have stats about what the regions are most affected, and CCP Nemesis says that they do. CCP Nemesis explains that there is also rampant botting in Safe Sov as well. He also adds that CCP never bans on reports alone, but it can help with their suspicions. Anomina asks if reports have gone down since the blackout, because the main way to report them is seeing them in local. Ixuki also mentions that he could go into a system and see 80 healers with a similar name on the D scanner, and he sees that as an indication of a bot. CCP Muppet Hunter asks what to st what's to stop a legitimate player from doing this. CCP Nemesis chimes in that this doesn't prove anything, but it is helpful for context. Olmeca Gold asks if they will use the blackout data for detecting bots, and CCP Nemesis says absolutely. CCP Nemesis mentions that they could see a big... Uh, Vex a Navy issue farm decided to stop playing in anticipation of the changes to that ship, but again it is not a conclusive indicator either as it may be a normal player. Vili says that the community is hungering for numbers about botting because they want to police themselves. Dunk Dinkle says that right now there is no tool in game that leadership could use to verify or manage these things better within their ranks and figure out how to identify bots. CCP Muppet Hunter says that this is a catch-22, as this will give botters access to the same tools. Olmeca Gold brings up that the reporter should get some feedback on when or if an action was taken on their report, and this is something that CCP is considering. CCP Nemesis says that the vision is for botters to not have a tangible effect on the game via three pillars. One pillar will be to tackle the visible botting, such as mining, ratting, faction warfare and missioning. So the second pillar is to tackle invisible botting that impacts the economy like market bots, and the third pillar is to put pressure on the RMT business to get out of the game, and that can be mostly achieved by fixing the game internally. Repeatable missions are something that CCB dislikes, 
because they can be automated so easily. Drone ship ratting was another thing, and he advocates for turning off aggression, but realises it may harm players more than just botters, especially new players. CCP Nemesis says that there are three objectives, and they want to find a detection system partner, such as something like Punk Buster, and take the industry ex uh, standard approach. Olmeca Gold asks about the report function in game again, and CCP Nemesis says that there will be a change deployed at the end, before the end of September, introducing automated BAM emails to reporters whenever an action has been taken against a reported player. Innomina asks about what the rate is of people contesting, and GM Ender says that everyone contests. Dunk Dinkle asks about 2FA and hacking accounts. Lead GM Stardust says that this is a big concern, and the industry standard adoption rate is incredibly low. CCP Nemesis says that he would love to force it at some point. GM Ender adds that SMS 2FA is coming soon, and they envision that it will be opt-in first, but heavily incentivized down the line. Innominate brings up password changing nuking ESI tokens, and thus deters changing passwords. Lead GM Stardust says that this is a classic case of usability versus security. Innominate suggests having the option to not remove the ESI when changing passwords. Lead GM Stardust says he understands that the CSM wants to keep their accounts safe, but there are a lot of players who want to just press a button and play. CCB Nemesis asks if corporations can put social pressure on members to get 2FA, and Aerith says that if they could see who has 2FA, they can be damn sure they'll get on it. Dunk Dinkle suggests giving some incentives to people to get 2FA, and then focus on these additional limitations. Olmeca Gold asks if there are any issues with giving this information to corp leaders, and Innominate says that it's probably a policy issue. Aerith brings up that returning legit players are extracting the second they come back, and their account gets banned. Steve Renukin asks for the ability to block extractions. C2B Nemesis says that if a hacker knows the limit is 4 hours, they will just wait 4 hours. Vili suggests limiting the extraction to characters with 2FA enabled. C2B Nemesis shifts the topic a bit and says that any time there is pressure put on botters through blogs, then RMTers will uh, shift over to hacking. CCB Nemesis has an interesting segue into the ESI and asks if there's any case where it's being used in any way for the botters or if there is information there that is useful for them, allowing creating a market order creation through the ESI would make market botting incredibly easy. Aerith mentions that local can be seen through the ESI by counting blues uh, since they know their locations. CCB Larrikin takes note of this, and CCB Nemesis points out that the ESI is being reviewed. CCB Nemesis goes back to the ISK equivalents thought. Uh, there will, they will be hunted based on these ISK equivalents that will in, uh, affect income bots, as they are the biggest issue for the economy. This includes loyalty points and mining, to name a few. He also noted that the Vex and Navy issue changes resulted in 10 to 12 new activities popping up as alternative botting methods because it was so effective. Ixuki mentions that the wormhole botters will change when the auto-targeting missile changes go through. CCB Nemesis asks if smart bombing battleships in anomalies are bottable, and the CSM says that this is the case and is a common tactic. CCB Nemesis asks if they have confirmed have heard of any verified uh, supercarrier bots, and the CSM says absolutely. CCB Nemesis asks how they could be identified. It seems that their means of ratting are not easy to identify, but it's always after the fact. CCB Nemesis asks if anyone is actually Titan botting, and Philly says yes, even though it's very expensive. There is speculation that the botters moved to super capitals after the blackout. CCP doesn't have the metrics about this, but they definitely saw a spike in those ships being used. Vili asks if there is a chance of getting any numbers out to the public or not. CCP Nemesis says that they will do monthly blogs now rather than quarterly, and work on the positive feedback tool. He also feels that the information released from Overwatch saying that there is a huge correlation between reporting and resulting in a ban, something along the lines of 85%. He also wants to focus on talking about the ISK ban. He wants to get to the point where botting is just so irrelevant and inconsequential that RMTs move on. Dunk Dinkle asks if there's anything that can be done about the RMT sites, and CCP Nemesis says that many aren't even breaking the law right now, as they aren't selling in-game items but rather a brokering platform between two parties. Section 16, Player Experience 
GM Arcade gives the CSM an introduction to the player experience team and gives a rundown about their roles and areas of responsibility. Innomina asks about the role of internal affairs in policing devs as they play the game. CCP Falcon explains what limitations are imposed on playstyles and roles available to devs when anonymously participating with EVE Corps as players. Ixuki and Merkel Chen says that he's heard that there's been a push internally to get more devs playing EVE, but he's spoken to several devs this week who feel like they can't properly engage with the game because they're worried they'll somehow break the rules. CCP Falcon and CCP Ender are surprised and concerned to hear this. A commitment was made to update the CCP Bible, a document which governs how devs interact with players, and making sure that devs feel relaxed about playing EVE. GM Arcade shows a series of graphs with, uh, with support ticket statistics. He goes on to explain the new meet and greet program, where GMs are proactively talking to new players, trying to answer their questions and direct them to useful resources. He continues saying that during the meet and greet, the players are sometimes offered a venture in a skin to help them get into new careers. Innominate suggests a better idea would be to get them into a more combat orientated career path and give them a ship that could run the SOE epic arc instead. We are already working on that. You should absolutely check out the community fitting section on the forums as well, GM Arcade replied. Gobbins asks if there's anything the CSM can do to help encourage Jevs to join large alliances or play in the Nullsec endgame. Mokul Chen and Aerith agree, and all three say they'd be willing to help shepherd devs into alliances and bypass the usual scrutiny during recruitment, as it means enabling them to experience more endgame Nullsec content. Dunk Dinkle agrees too. GM Arcade explains the concept of mag magic moments, such as when a new player suffers their first significant loss, such as their first battleship being destroyed. GMs reach out to players when that happens, uh, give them some advice and replace the lost ship, which encourages them to continue their journey in EVE Online. Dunk Dinkle says that this is basically what they do in Brave in terms of supporting new players who have suffered losses and confirms that it works. Merkel Chen asks if there's any data on the results of the Magic Moments program. GM Arcade says they've spoken to about 250 people so far and this information will be available soon. GM Lelouch gives an explanation about CCP's new live chat support during registration and shows some statistics about customer satisfaction with GM support chats. GM Stardust talks to the CCP about a new SP extraction alert tool which CCP uses to intercept hacked accounts before too much harm is done. He says that SP extracted due to hacked accounts has been reduced by approximately 90% since the tool was employed. He continues by talking about security methodology, which I probably shouldn't record here. Afterwards, the discussion moves to the importance of having 2FA enabled to protect accounts. Aerith says that the option to permanently disable skill extraction on their accounts should be an option that players can choose, or at the very least temporarily disable skill extraction, but then require 2FA to be enabled on the end account before SP could be extracted again. CCP and CSM continue to discuss measures uh, to incentivize the adoption of 2FA. Section 17, Community Support. With the team growing in size, CCP Dopamine would like to have a brainstorm to hear from the CSM what projects or initiatives they think the community should be looking into. Aerith says that CCP could reach out to newbie programs such as Brave or Horde to find out what the most common things they have to explain newbies is, and then make a series of instructional YouTube videos to cover off those issues that they can just direct new players to watch. The videos could be produced by CCP or by community content creators for CCP under commission. Dunk Dinkle loads up the Brave Dojo website to show a list of areas of focus that Brave provides to new players which CCP could adopt. CCP Falcon suggests a similar page with videos embedded for brand new players to do a self-guided tour through some of the important pieces of institutional knowledge. Dunk Dinkle and Anominate say that videos are great, but if too long, people will turn them off. Any videos should be short, and there should be written directions for people who want to search quickly. Steve Renukin suggests a drip-feeding video to the players with marketing emails in the days and weeks after they register and start playing. The discussion moves to the challenges of streaming a game like EVE on Twitch. CCP Dopamine says that he would like to see CCP producing some regular content again on Twitch. 
not necessarily a full-blown talk show like the 07 show, but uh, just a weekly or bi-weekly show with devs talking to the community or trying new features. He also said he would prefer for CCV's strategy to promote particular talents and content creators rather than the product itself so that they can build communities around themselves. Olmeca Gold says that Abyssal Dead Space is ideal for streaming due to the short play sessions and attractive environments. Arath suggested that CCP could use the fleet fight notifications to prepare and stream big fights as they happen. CCP Falcon mentions that there's a space in the new CCP HQ under construction, which will focus as an audio and video production studio where hardware can be set up permanently for streaming purposes. Vili asks about more Twitch integration and UI optimization of the EVE client to make life easier for streamers. CCP Dopamine says that that would cool, but we'd have to demonstrate that there's enough audience to justify the development time. Aerith says he likes watching chill EVE online stuff, like the Jitter un Undock live cam. CCP could have a permanent live stream of chilled parts of EVE. CCP Falcon says it's been considered in the past, but nothing came of it, but agrees it'd be nice to get happening. Omeka Gold asks if the Alliance tournament is gone forever. CCP Dopamine says that the community team would really like to see the AT come back, because they understand it was special to an important group of EVE players. CCP Falcon says that he loves the AT and has a long history with it, he identifies some issues in bringing it back, to sp including space to produce the stream, uh, development time to make sorely needed updates to the tournament tools, staffing the tournament, since in the past it's been a passion project and relies on CCP volunteers, and general stagnation of the format of the tournament. Aerith suggests making the AT Grand Prize the Palatine Keepstar that gets moved to the location of the winner's choice. Section 18. The Art of EVE Online. CCP Yorg makes a round of introductions for the room, and then pulls up some fancy new art. Dunk Dinkle gives a shout out to the new skin that changes colour when in warp. CCP Yorg shows the new aura design, and says they want to do a lot more with the characters, and give them a lot more visibility in the client in the future. Old aura was just a static image, but the new one is an actual character model that can be used anywhere in the client. There were also some tasks that had to be addressed for the future in the release in China. The overall plan is to do this to all NPCs down the line. Gobin, uh, Gobbins asks, where would they appear in the game? There are plenty of options available, such as the agent window, tutorials, and so on. Olmeca Gold asks if it's intentional that Aura feels more human now. CCP Undas says that this is just because we have never seen characters in this scenario before. Olmeca Gold asks about the voice changes that seem less robotic, and this has been confirmed as an intentional design choice. The next pictures show the exploration of possible character augmentations. This takes the cyberpunk face augments to the next level, with body augmentations and biomechanical designs. Ixuki asks if there's any plan on how to introduce these into the game, but that is up to art, not up to art to decide. Some facial animation examples were shown, and CCB Unders explains that they want to work on the tech side too, in order to make it easier to render in the client. The Jitter redesign was shown. Merkel Chen asks if this will affect the performance at all. CCB Yorg says it shouldn't have an effect outside of the grid. Ixuki asks if players will need to make new dock bookmarks. This is something that is being taken into consideration. Gobbins asks if any visual upgrades could be purchased for Citadels. CCP Yorg says they've had the idea of making the game feel more alive and adapting, and this is being looked into for other trade hubs. Vili asks if this is the only version of this type of a change that is planned at the moment. This is the main focus, but the same could be done with other locations in the future. A discussion came up about getting modular blocks for citadels, as there is a clear desire to have a player identity. The art team is aware of this, but this is not something they can tackle alone and would require a bigger effort from other teams. Amar was brought up about the Titan sitting there and Dunk Dinkle asked if this could be done for Jitter 2 in some way. The audio team shows that what they are working on. The London and Reykjavik teams joined forces to improve the audio of EVE Online. They've started to work on the voice management systems, turret outbursts and turret impacts. They want to address the lonely sounds in smaller fights and make them more natural and atmospheric. Wormhole music, ship engines, cloaking, hangars, and travel are all being worked on and modernized. They show a work-in-progress thruster and engine concept. 
Exuki asks if there will be racial variants in the audio. This has not been planned, but there will be differences between the sizes of the ships. Exuki asks about reload sounds, and the team replies that they have some ideas for that. CCP Oldboy mentions the jukebox, and that isn't that it isn't needed today, as people have Spotify, iTunes, and stuff. They instead want to take the music and make it part of the environment. The wormhole space will be eerie and frightening. Rather than creating whole songs, they are creating parts that help with the atmosphere in space. They call it sound mass music that is very vertical with no clear melodies. Steve Renukin asked about Eve music on Spotify. It is on SoundCloud, but it is outdated and not so convenient to listen. Ixuki asked if there's going to be a difference in the music between Wormhole Class. CCP Oldboy says that they actually want to hear feedback from them about what they believe makes sense. Ixuki mentions that music should be more lonely and isolated the deeper you venture into wormholes. Omega Gold says it should get more dangerous sounding and eerier as you get into the C6 sites. Empire Space Music is also being changed into this system, and they will later discuss where to make the old music available. Gobbins asks about Nullsec Space and if the team has ideas about how to tackle that. They respond that they will make the music similar to Wormhole Space, but differentiating it by using an orchestra instead. Vili suggests making the music change based on an on-grid based level. So, undocking from the home station plays safe sounding music, but then when going out to an asteroid belt that in most cases a peaceful, is a peaceful environment, the music changes to reflect that. The same would then happen when going into combat sites. There is a change coming to the voice management system that will drastically help with CPU performance in fleet fights. CCP Mirka brings up a couple of fixes that are going out with the next release. Low shader quality on stars is getting fixed. He then shows the wormhole's visual change and explains that they ensure that it is now following the rule that VFX on low shader quality should be as cheap as possible on performance whilst ensuring they are gameplay representative. Wormhole age and mass remaining is receiving better visuals as well as ship size uh, restrictions. Industrial slash visual sino is being worked on. Dunk Dinkle asks about the Farallux startup animation being looped once an hour, also for a visually pleasing moment uh, that others get to see because the animation is amazing. Olmeca Gold mentions that the panic animation going away when warping from the grid and black. This will be looked into. Section 19 Visual Effects Feedback CCP Mirka presents the CSM with additional art assets that didn't fit into the previous session. A video showing the jitter renovations over time is played. Nerds get sweaty. CCB Convict can't help himself and asks if they're going to dress the set with some supercarriers or something to impress new players. Art Team says that it is a great idea and they will look into it. Art Team demonstrates the upcoming real-time reflection feature which will show planets, nebulas, etc. in space on reflective surfaces of ships. Looks dank. Next up is concept art for worker drones and modular cargo and transport ships intended to add ambient life and immersion to the interior and exterior of stations. Gobbins asks if the art team has considered adding some kind of cosmetic traffic between citadels that are on grid close to one another. Art team unveils a new funerary monument which will be erected in or near the player-created graveyard in Malia, featuring a vigil sino inspired by light. Uh, that will flare every six hours. Olmeca Gold suggested to also have a special flare that occurred once a year. Art team said they'd look into it. Ixuki suggested that the Memorial Sino could be restarted monthly and have a really cool looking starting animation. Suddenly the room is blinded by flashes of light and blurring sounds of two carbon based bodies clashing with each other. When everyone comes back to their senses they can see what finally caused it it is a new Voltron-like form of Dunk Dinkle and Exuki, Dunk Zuki, who joined forces to formally request a Balgorn skin. The art team smiled and murmured something. Vili requested some skin lines that have been added to the database and are visible in the market to actually be released, such as several Steel Cardinal sins. Uh, Merkel Chen says that players on potato mode can't see when Titans and Kovop bridges are activated. He asks the art team to make a lower shader quality version of the bridge effect that gives them some kind of graphical feedback. Section 20, Audio Feedback. 
CCP Old Boy says that Audio wants to create new and update existing music for the whole game. They want to create ambient tracks that seem larger and grander and enhance the scale of the game through the audio. Innominate says that music matters most for the players who are new to the game. He says that by the time some players get further into the game and are running multiple clients, they tend to turn off sound so that there are fewer distractions. CCP Old, Old Boy says they're thinking of some kind of audio feedback, for example if your guns are at or within their optimal range, they make a subtly different sound. Exuki suggests a different sound when ships in your fleet are locking you versus ships that aren't in your fleet. Dunk Dinkle and Anominate talk about context sensitive music that's different when you land on a grid that's industrial, e.g. an asteroid belt or something that has an Adfanor, or land on a grid that has hostile NPCs that has more intense music but says was back into ambient music once they've been destroyed or warped off. Ixuki suggests that there could be different ambient music based depending on what type of ship you're in. Omeka Gold says that there could be more exciting music when a ship enters warp or suffering hull damage. Merkel Chen thinks that that's cool. The CSM continue to suggest different environmental and ship conditions that could potentially have audio cues. CCP Old Boy asked if the CSM would be cool with them removing all the old tracks from the game to make way for new music as long as the old tracks went on Spotify and they indicated that that would be okay. Section 21, Shareable Bookmarks. CCP Habakkuk assumes that everyone in the room already knows what these will be. The project is progressing and is starting to look like a certainty. Release date is not decided yet. Dunk Dinkle asks if they are ACL controlled and that has been confirmed to be the case. Bookmarks are stored in folders, and each folder has an ACL assigned to it. Personal folders don't deal with the ACL system, but only shared ones. Some confusion occurred with the wording of the different access states for the bookmark folders. One clarification provided was the difference between view and use. View means the player can warp to the bookmark and use means they get rights to create bookmarks in the folder but not edit existing ones. The manage role allows them to delete bookmarks and then admins can delete the option to access the folder. The naming is not final and subject to change. Linking the folder in a chat will allow those players on the ACL to add the folder. There are limits on how many folders a player can have active and how many bookmarks are in each folder. These folders can be subscribed to and deactivated when not used to go around the limit. Inactive folders do not take up space in the limit. Innominate asks about copying bookmarks between links, and CCP confirms that it is possible. Schematics of selling bookmarks was brought up, and that would be done by creating one ACL and separate folders for the bookmarks, and then linking to each folder to the player as the only way to view these folders is by getting a link shared. The team expects that ma the majority of folders will be on the public ACL and then links to the folders shared to keep it private in that sense. Innominate suggests that there should be some way to verify who the creators of the list is, and the team had discussed that but not re reached a conclusion about how to implement it yet. Dunk Dinkle brings up the creator aspect, such as when a player creates a folder and leaves the corp. And CCP Master Plan says this is why they're not putting emphasis on who created the folder but initially, but rely on the ACL managers for that instead. CCP Renukin points out that there is no way to validate if the folders are the right ones or prevent players from creating fake folders to trick other pilots. CCP Master Plan says that they're aware of it. Olmeca Gold says that with the new system, there's some added complication with low trust trade methods. Vili mentions that with the introduction of the, this, the ACLs will be cons used considerably more, and ACLs are very complicated, and he asks if there is any intention to release a new video or tutorial, and the team says that there are no plans for something like that at the moment. CCB Habakkuk says that if they have any suggestions on improvements, he would like to hear them. ESI was brought up to manage ACLs, but is not technically feasible right now. CCB Habakkuk brings up the court bookmarks, and currently there is a 5 minute rolling delay, and the new system is looking at a 2 minute strict delay. You will be able to see the bookmark immediately, but after 2 minutes it can be used. The CSM has no objection to that. Exuki asks if the greyed out ones that are not yet available will appear in space, and that is not the case. 
the expiry settings are optional and this was asked about in a forum thread about the duration options that players would want to see. The last selected setting is saved in the client and would be specific to each folder. Steve Renukin asks if editing this timer after creation is possible, the expiration can be cancelled but not edited. The exact duration offers, uh, options available will be decided later. Dunk Dinkle asks if there will be any way to distinguish between shared and private folders and there is an icon to help with that. CCB Habakkuk asks who, who the CSM thinks should have access to the court bookmarks when they get transitioned. To provide some clarifications, the very likely outcome of the initial setup will be that all court members can use and add bookmarks and delete bookmarks, which they added. Um, directors will be able to configure the folder and do other operations, such as deleting bookmarks they didn't make. Corporations will need to update these default ACLs based on their needs. Those ACLs will also not update automatically if someone is losing or gaining the director role. Ixuki asks about copying bookmarks and is leaning towards not having the option to copy bookmarks in share folders. CCP would want to see this as an option in order to have the ability to organize the bookmarks. Ixuki says that it would have to be at least the top two levels to avoid spy shenanigans. There are some legit reasons to have the ability to copy bookmarks, such as to bypass folder limitations. Ixuki admits that this could be a potential scope creep, but getting some logs to be able to track who may have copied or deleted bookmarks or folders. Uh, CCP Howcook says that this is outside of scope for now, but there are internal tools being created specifically for this by game master, uh, for game masters to refer to. Section 22, the marketing team. A round of introductions is done, CCP Goodfellow starts up a presentation that includes past, present and future tasks. He starts by showing that the new EVE Online website has a download button clearly visible, which is met with a round of applause from the CSM. The new front page feels like a home page rather than a landing page where you can learn more about the game. So far metrics have not shown any difference in the AB test with the download button, but they were doing a soft launch for this. A new welcome email was tested and resulted in getting a 35% uptick in click rate and uplift in click to open rate. Down the line, they will be adding a get started in EVE to help give some ideas of what the new player can do. The meet and greet have been changed and they will be hearing more about it in a session with the player experience team. The Plex rewards in the recruitment program have been removed as they were being exploited. This did not have any negative effect on the customer based metrics. CCP Renukin wants to see players coming organically into the game and the recruitment program. Another initiative was the Twitch Prime and Synesis Omega bundle. Dunk Dinkle asked if partnering with Twitch had any negative implications or heavy cost. The business model for Twitch Prime made it easy to participate and did not cost CCP anything outside of the internal resources. The Twitch Bounty Board was a different campaign that also came with unique challenges. CCP wants to test more but acknowledges that new people streaming EVE is not an ideal way to advertise the game. An experiment was made to contact a specific group of pay players and appeal to their gameplay, such as the Wormhole campaign. This was a small pool of people and there may have been some bleed over into another similar campaign, so determining data from from the data the success of this reactivation campaign is difficult. The team would want to hear any feedback and ideas on how to make this better in the future. Olmeca Gold suggested doing this when substantial changes happen. In-game news item storyline was brought up and Steve Renukin points out that the newsletter came out before the dev blog and he believes that it should have come out at the same time in the future. Recently created YouTube videos from Quill18 were brought up due to the impact they had on new players trying out EVE Online. Steve Renukin suggests creating a bounty board for players to create tutorials from the community. Login campaigns will be similar to what they have been doing, but the cadence is up for discussion, whether it should be more frequent or less. The latest campaigns were tied with offers and have worked better than previously. CCP wants to look into the retention numbers to see if these reactivations are just spikes or something sustainable, more testing will continue. Dunk Dinkle says that there has been has to be a draw for San Diego beyond just a new city to make sure that people don't just think, why go to San Diego when I could just go to Vegas? 
Merkel Chen says that Vegas is always predictable in its scheduling and that they should stay away from that third week in October to, present un to prevent unnecessary conflicts. Izuki says that they should have made sure to let the players know about the San Diego change what, as soon as the decision was made. Section 23, The Character Creator The eventual plan down the line is twofold, to have all new players start in the same system and to simplify the Empire selection. The art team has looked at where people drop out of the character selection screen and made changes based on those metrics. The biggest drops have been on the Empires and Technology screens, followed by the character customization. A question came up whether people were too lazy to read the Empire descriptions, and it's rather that the information is not clear or meaningful. The team noticed that players read into this information without realising that it does not have any gameplay impact outside of changing the aesthetics and will get confused. This has to be cleared up. The team also noticed that 10% of all players will select an Empire of Bloodline and then get into customization before going back to the Empire selection. Some recent improvements to the Download On Demand DoD, system resulted in better performance and shorter loading times for newer players. The next test the team wants to run is to have pre-randomization of new characters to see if that has any impact on character creation. It is important that we clearly communicate the limitations of what can and cannot be changed for free later on. Merkel Chen notes that, amongst other things, people will pay a lot for a gender change inside the game. Some concerns were being raised about the family name seeming mandatory and confusion with the limit of spaces used. CCB Muppet Hunter says that in the future they will transition from the current list of last names they, it, that are in the hundreds to a list that is in the thousands and that will drastically reduce the chance of a name not being available. Vili suggests changing the board ship text when logging into the game to something that is more descriptive such as confirm or finalize. There are discussions about the Empire selection setup from a UX perspective as well, as how the UI changes when entering full customization. Dunk Dinkle mentioned that CCP should explain what the starting station is or remove that option entirely. The CSM thinks raw clones need to be changed to something else. Section 24 Eve Portal Dunk Dinkle says that the two main issues he has heard about the new EVE portal are Android compatibility issues and some UI problems when it comes to typing and entering information. CCP Time Runner says the compatibility issue was caused by a Google update to Android. A new version of the app was put together and resubmitted. A new beta version was made to resolve the compatibility issues and so far the feedback has been positive. He asks for more information on the UI input issues, and the CSM shares their thoughts. Steve Renukin wants the send button moved to the top of the screen so it's not masked by the keyboard when entering text. He goes on to mention the problem adding names to emails. CCP Time Runner tells the CSM that an update to fix some UI problems is coming. Innominate says that being able to change the skill cues from outside Eve, the Eve client is amazing. Dunk Dinkle enthusiastically agrees. Anominate requests some minor quality of life improvements to how skills are added and managed in the queue. Arith points out that depreciated skills, in this case astronautics engineering, which are no longer available but still in the database, shouldn't be shown as available for purchase. CCP Time Runner explains that while not ideal, it's more streamlined to just list all the skills, but that it might be possible to optimize the list of available skills. Steve Renukin points out that it's a full screen app, but his phone doesn't have off screen buttons, so the app hides them. CCP Time Runner points out that it's an intended feature usually associated with full screen games, but agrees that it might be causing some confusion. He will look into making it an option in the settings. The conversation moves on from bugs to upcoming features. Dunk Dinkle says he'd like some ability to view or manage financial transactions and assets. He says that most people he hears from would love to move from third-party apps to a more secure CCB-controlled environment for managing these things. Omeka Gold says he'd like to see Ghost Fitting added to the app. Vili says that tells CCP Stardust about Dotland and how useful it is to EVE players. 
He suggests features like maps, jump planners, etc. would be great. He also requests a kill feed to track personal and corp kill reports. CCP Timerunner asks if CCP should be duplicating perfectly good third party features and their functionality. Arith says some features could be duplicated from third party apps and then improved. Arith and Dunk Dinkle have a conversation about prioritizing new features. Arith thinks it should be market focused. Dunk Dinkle thinks it should be focused on assets. Olmeca Gold thinks it should be fitting. Steve Renouk and Dias disagrees. CCP Time Runner provides a list of top requested features from a survey that was carried out a while back. Arith says that PI would be super useful to a lot of people because it would allow players to make in-game money from their phone, but he thinks it might be unrealistic for CCP to pull off. CCP Time Runner says they might be able to add some PI features to the client, if only in terms of managing established PI systems and not necessarily implementing the entire feature. CCP Rax says that one of the objectives with the app is for players to have shorter sessions throughout the day so that they can enjoy some more meaningful parts of EVE Online gameplay when they get home and log in. Some discussion about the merits of adding support for niche gameplay, for example industry, to the client. Exuki says that if support for some of those things was added to the client, such as the ability to research BPOs or commence production of items, then maybe these things wouldn't be as niche anymore. Dunk Dinkle says that having access to his industry jobs throughout the day would mean that he could spend more time in space when he gets home. Gobbins agreed that initiating and completing industry apps from jobs from the app would be a very popular feature. Steve Renukin points out that increasing accessibility for things like industry would lead to a big in increase in productivity without a similar increase in demand and affect the profit margins of small industrial operators. Vili says that PI is an easy way for new players to make money early in their career and that being able to manage their PI from their phones will let them spend more time actually playing EVE when they're at their computer. Arith agrees. CCB Rax asks what would be the top three features for EVE Portal going forward. The general consensus is that market, industry and, PV and PI would be the highest, with chat close behind. CCB Time Runner comments that some of these would be full features, some of them would be partial features. For instance, the chat could be implemented as a full feature, but only parts of PI make sense on a mobile device, as some of them would involve a lot of different systems. Anominate says that partial PI would be fine, the setup isn't really needed, that can be done on the PC, it's mainly the daily maintenance. CCB Time Runner replies that the same would be the case with market trading. You'd be able to log in and browse the market, however you wouldn't be able to move characters around New Eden to look at different markets. Dunk Dinkle says he'll, spend, he'll be spending more time on the toilet now that he has more things to do. He also requests shorter cycles with smaller updates to the app, rather than big expansions that take months to develop. Final note, in addition to the sessions covered here, there was also a new feature session which is currently under NDA, and a Players of EVE Online session which is referring to something which will be shown at Vegas, and therefore is being kept a secret until that event to, from the general player base. Addendum, CCP Convict's 10 hour slow cooked pulled pork. This recipe calls for a slow cooker slash crock pot, but you can do this in an oven or kettle barbecue over indirect cut heat if you would prefer. Ingredients. Pork shoulder, 2 kilograms. Cola, 600 milliliters. Your favorite barbecue sauce, 500 milliliters. Worcestershire sauce, 1 tablespoon. Hot sauce, 2 teaspoons. Chili flakes, 2 teaspoons. Salt, 1 tablespoon. Pepper, 1 tablespoon. Onion powder, 1 tablespoon. Garlic powder, 1 tablespoon. Paprika, 2 teaspoons. A brown or yellow onion. First, trim the skin and fat off your pork shoulder. Combine the salt, pepper, garlic, onion powder, and paprika in a small bowl and mix to make the rub. Rub this over your pork shoulder with the spike mix, spice mix. Wrap the pork in cling or saran wrap, or a large snap lock bag, and then leave in the fridge for at least 3 hours, but you can also leave it overnight if you want to prepare your pork the night before. Roughly chop the onion and place it into the bottom of your slow cooker. Place your pork into the slow cooker over the onion. Combine the cola, 3 quarters of the barbecue sauce, Worcestershire sauce, hot sauce and chili flakes into a bowl and mix together. Pour this sauce mixture over the pork in the slow cooker. 
set your slow cooker onto the low setting and cook pork cook let the cork oh let the pork cook for 10 hours once done remove the pork and set aside on a large pan or tray transfer the remaining juices from the slow cooker into a saucepan and place over a high heat on the stove to reduce add the remaining one quarter of a bottle of barbecue sauce to the saucepan Whilst this sauce is reducing, pull your pork using a pair of forks until you have a pile of delicious steaming shredded meat. Once the pork has once the sauce has been reduced by about half, add it to the shredded pork in batches and toss until all the pork is generously coated. You will probably have quite a bit of sauce left over, so don't worry if you don't use it all. Serve your barbecued pulled pork with coleslaw and extra hot sauce if that's your jam. Enjoy.